Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started. Um, it's five after seven, and we've got a, a full, um, a full uh, allotment of uh, hearings tonight. Before we jump into the first hearing, uh, which is going to be a joint hearing, uh, this is our public comment question of the program. So if anybody has any issues that have nothing to do with what we're about to talk about tonight, uh, please raise your hand, and we can hear from you. Yep. Can I just get your name and address? My name is Amy Royal. From? Um, I'm a business owner and property owner in Northampton. Okay. And is this relative to the what we're about to listen to? Um, I'd like to ra raise a procedural issue um, at the outset that the second agenda item is inappropriately listed on the agenda that's, that's, tonight. We'll get into that. Um, um, and I respectfully request to be heard and object to going forward with this meeting when this item should not be even on the agenda tonight. Understood. So I think that needs to be resolved first. Understood. But thank you. Does anybody else have anything uh, that doesn't relate to the hearings, any of the hearings tonight? No. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to open up the first hearing, which is a joint hearing between the Planning Board and the Central Business uh, Architectural Board. Um, and let me just walk you through what's going to happen. Um, we're going to open up the hearing and uh, have a presentation from the applicant to both boards. There's going to be a lot of uh, questions, give and take, between the boards uh, and the applicant. And it'll be an internal discussion, give and take. When that uh, process has been exhausted, then we will open it up to the public comment section of the evening and we'll, and we'll listen to what everybody has to say. At that point, however, we are going to pretty much stop the hearing. We're going to continue the hearing. We can't make a decision tonight uh, because there are CPA funds tied into this uh, potential development. And one of the contingencies that came along with the funding was that a separate meeting with the CPA in a public setting has to be held outside of this meeting. So we can discuss what's going to, what this project's all about, the pros and cons and so forth, but we can't make a decision. So you're going to have at least two other opportunities to address um, what may or may not be concerning you with at the CPA meeting. And then I expect everybody's going to be back here again in January, either another joint committee or separate separate meeting. So, um, council as well. so this isn't the end of the process. Uh, we're near the end of the process, but uh, no decision will be made tonight. So I just want to make that clear. So uh, with that said, I'd like to open up uh, scheduled for 7 o'clock. Uh, CBAC uh, architectural permit and site plan review for demolition of existing and construction of a new four-story 69,785 square foot mixed residential commercial building at 256 Pleasant Street, Northampton map ID 32C-171 as published on November 26th and December 4th. So um, we have a an applicant for the presentation. Um, good evening, my name is Joanne Campbell, and I'm the Executive Director of Valley Community Development Corporation, a local nonprofit here in Northampton, um, whose primary uh, goal is to develop affordable housing. Uh, we're here tonight to present our plans for the redevelopment of the Northampton Lumberyard uh, into 55 units of uh, rental housing along with commercial space along Pleasant Street and uh, Holyoke Street. Um, I just wanted to mention that we've had a number of community meetings uh, we, uh, with interested parties, some individual meetings. We've had um, um, meetings with abutters, with property owners and business owners and other uh, interested community members. Um, the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association had invited us to their um, uh, annual meeting in October, which was an informal meeting which we attended. Uh, with their help, we sponsored two meetings October 30th, uh, at one at the Chamber and one at Bridge Street School. And as a follow-up to those meetings, we had another meeting last week at Beehive Sewing uh, with business mm -hmm. abutters and other property owners in the area. Um, as uh, the Chairman mentioned, uh, the, we applied for CPA funds. One of the conditions, assuming it's approved, is that we should have another meeting with the community. And I have uh, set a date for that and had found a location. So that meeting will be held on Monday, December 29th um, at the Collaborative um, on uh, Holly Street at 6 p.m. And I'll be sending out uh, notices this week for that meeting. Um, one thing we heard very clearly from um, many of the abutters is more commercial space on the first floor. 
um, and we are interested in having further discussions regarding that. Uh, but I do want to say that the site plan that we've submitted and the information for the CBAC, those further discussions would not affect the site plan that we've submitted. Um, I, we have our development team here today. Um, we have representatives from the architectural firm, landscape design, and civil engineering. And I would like to ask uh, Cliff Bomer, who is uh, the architect for the project, to come up and make the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Cliff, before you jump in, just one procedural note. Alan, you had something to say? Yes, um, I just wanted to disclose that a number of years ago, I'm not sure when, five to ten, between five and ten years ago, perhaps, I was on the board of um, the CDC for a couple of years. I would say it's more than five years ago, but I don't know what. Yeah, definitely more than five. Um, <clears throat> so I. I understand from Carolyn I'm still eligible to sit here, but I guess if anyone has objections, they can voice them. If anyone has an issue uh, with Alan's impartiality, uh, just raise your hand and he can recuse himself. Uh, we don't think it's going to be an issue, but we need to make it uh, clear. When you should announce it, Tess already has. Right. We have one member that's already uh, recused herself as well, Tess, who's uh, a local abutter to the project. So anybody have any issues with Alan? No. Okay. Cliff. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Cliff Bomer. I'm a principal at Davis Square Architects and working with the CDC. And tonight with me is Imad Zrain, who is a civil engineer, and Walter Kadnikovsky, who's our landscape architect, uh, who actually was the author of the Central Business District guidelines a number of years ago. Uh, but what I'd like to do, I'll, I'll run through, we have two <coughs> state slideshows. One of them is the, for the Central Business District, and that's the first one I'll run through because I think that gives the overall feeling and character and inspiration for the building. And then move over into the planning board set, which is a little more technically oriented. Uh, but I'll try to run through them fairly quickly, I cover a lot of territory, leave lots of time for questions and let's you want to interrupt with questions, whichever way you want to do it is fine. Let's see how it goes and then we'll the, well the, So the first thing I, I wanted to talk about is, is the inspiration for the site, which is uh, pretty self-evident. I think it stands at a really prominent location on Pleasant Street from the south. It's a real gateway that's visible before you hit the curve on Pleasant Street as it, as it shifts to the west a little bit. And from the uh, downtown and from the more uh, densely uh, intensely uh, developed and it's also uh, a real marker for the uh, for the end of that district and, and uh, a first step for implementing the central business district guidelines and laid out a vision for uh, the quality of that street so the uh, we spent a lot of time studying the, the guidelines because we did find those really uh, really provided a lot of great material for us to work with in the design of the building. The fundamentals of the building, I think you may already know, but maybe not everybody knows, it's we're proposing uh, 55 residential homes on the development and uh, two, two uh, substantial commercial spaces, one right on Pleasant Street, the other on Holyoke Street. The Holyoke Street space is about 2,500 square feet that we believe will house the Community Development Corporation, Valley CDC. The tenant for the uh, Pleasant Street uh, space, which is about 1,500 square foot, is currently laid out. Uh, hasn't been designated yet, uh, but we've uh, laid the space out in a way that we think it will be very attractive for a number of developers uh, or, or tenants. And I'll just uh, say one more thing, I think one of our, uh, Joanne mentioned a lot of the meetings that, that we've gone to, and we went to one last week, it was a week ago, tonight, and met with a lot of the local business owners on Pleasant Street, and I would say uh, <clears throat> uniformly there was a high degree of confidence in the ability of Pleasant Street to develop up to this kind of density, and as Joanne pointed out, the, uh, the main comment we did hear from the attendees at that meeting was, provide more uh, commercial space, which we do have. A, we have a, a pretty decent-sized footprint. 
uh, so with that, I'm going to I'm going to move a little closer because some of these things I want to read. I, I, I want to quote some from, or at least really make a lot of direct references to the guidelines because we really did pay a lot of attention to those. We see this as uh, because of where it sits on on uh, Pleasant Street, it it wants to fit in with the theme building and its design as such. As far as the, the overall height of the building, percentage of glazing, references to nearby historic buildings. Uh, I'm sure, th and these two images were picked uh, for obvious reasons. The upper image is a nice rounded turret on a building with some ornamental uh, horizontal lines that break up the height of the building and provide a lot of visual interest. The image below is actually from the rooftop of that existing lumber yard uh, showroom, the low, the low building that, that would, of course, be demolished to make way. And I think that, that looks towards the north, and that's really the area of opportunity for, uh, you know, for the, uh, the guidelines for being fulfilled, all the space that does exist uh, to create the pedestrian-friendly type of uh, environment that you're talking about. Um, we could look at that next slide, but there are a number of points. I think some, of, I'll just pick out a couple of things. If, I think if you, uh, if you look at the bottom gray area there for the theme, theme built buildings, uh, we talked about, it, it talks about no setbacks or really minimizing setbacks except where there's a view to a public space, which we have created. If you look at the rendering, We have on the right hand side of our building, we've pulled it back from the adjacent historic building and created a public plaza, which is actually where the residential entry is. The shape of the building is rounded, because, and you'll see better once you start looking at the site plan. There's a slight curvature to the front of the building. I mean, you see the kind of funny uh, shape, it kind of is really an understatement. A very oddly shaped frontage we have. The curve was a way for us to really maximize uh, frontage on the street, get some visible frontage, and to relate to some of the other buildings in Northampton, and as I said, create that kind of gateway uh, from the south. Uh, I think a lot of these uh, we looked at rather uh, religiously. I think this is an interesting one. New theme buildings, which are wider than tall, should be vertically divided, and you can certainly see in some of the existing fabric the notion of taking blocks and dividing it vertically is exactly what we are trying to accomplish with our building is create some interest and break that scale down vertically. Uh, other points, I mean, there's a lot of uh, things that you, you folks all know about the uh, putting the or symmetrically organized windows, typical windows being organized, uh, having uh, uh, tall proportions. We do have ganged windows and you'll see the reference for those. Uh, also taking some uh, references from nearby buildings and you'll see I think it's in the next slide the choice of where our sign band is. Uh, the notion of heavily glazed first floor uh, with a kind of a traditionally based sign, sign band was important to us. Uh, I won't go through all these but we can go to the, there's a lot of material. <coughs> So this is a building right across the street on Holyoke Street. And uh, we see our building as a kind of, uh, these are the two buildings that are uh, immediately, well, they're on the same side of the street as we are, that we saw a lot of inspiration in. Uh, our building has uh, two different brick colors. We're taking uh, one brick color from this building and adding some horizontal lines with a darker brick on this piece. This is a building right across Holyoke with a uh, large gang windows on it. Very uh, simple. And neither of these buildings have a lot of elaborate, tiny, <coughs> detailed masonry. But we sure wanted to get a lot of masonry into our building and, as I said, really maximize that space, get as much uh, masonry on the street as we could. Uh, some of the fundamentals, rooftop equipment, hidden, which we will do. We have our, our, our uh, tallest part of our building is 52 feet tall. I think you know the guidelines. The guidelines uh, don't quite jive with the zoning, but the guidelines say that theme building should be between 30 and 55 feet tall. Ours is 52 feet tall up to the top of that parapet. Uh, we do use uh, uh, 
uh, decorative corbelled parapets on the building and as well as uh, lintels and sills. Uh, we've taken the horizontal line for our sign van directly off of our neighbor's building. And we're really trying to, uh, because as you know, the kind of fabric uh, gets kind of PC. The further you move down the street, it kind of the fabric breaks up. So we're kind of trying to make a grab across to this building to engage it in a larger composition to help get a kind of critical mass uh, to help, as I said, start that uh, new, uh, uh, new opportunity for other theme buildings uh, north of us on Pleasant Street. Uh, these are just some nearby buildings with some of the building heights and features that we liked. Uh, again, the kind of rounded <coughs> parapet with uh, some horizontal decorations. This is just right up the street from us, same side of the street, a rounded corner. Uh, this is the building right across from us on Holyoke Street that we looked at the straight on elevation before, which also is beveled going around the corner. This is close to us. It's about 40. Uh, I didn't actually measure it, but it's, I think it's between 44, 48 feet tall. Again, the highest point of ours is uh, 52 feet. Here's our neighbor uh, just to the south, and then right across the street where the coffee shop is and the beehive. Um, but uh, those are our neighbors. Uh, just to make that point, I, I think probably everybody here knows that, but there, there are some variances with the guidelines and the actual zoning. Uh, the zoning actually does say the building can be as high as 70 feet, where of course nowhere uh, near that. Uh, the commercial space uh, is a minimum of 20 feet. We're deeper than that uh, considerably. The amount of commercial space we have on both of our streets exceeds by about 50 percent what the minimum would be. Uh, no minimum parking requirement. We actually have 41 parking spaces on the site uh, located primarily around the back of the building. Uh, here's a site plan, and I, I'm not going to go into huge detail about it because I have two guys here who, who really worked more on the site plan than I did. But this is that uh, a little park area that we've created. The main residential entry is off of that park. Uh, we also created another open space along Short Street. Short Street is not a town or a city street. It's a private street, so we really don't have any uh, access privileges on that street, but we wanted to make it something that certainly could be a nice amenity, assuming that the other owners along Short Street were supportive of that. Uh, the parking is oriented back along the railroad tracks uh, and wrap, wraps around in, the, in this fashion. There are multiple entries into the building. This is the space that would be occupied by the CDC, by Valley. And this is the, as of yet, undesignated commercial space. We have bike parking, but again, I don't want to step on Walt's or uh, Imad's uh, better detailed description of site plan. Oh, I will, will point out that's that very awkward. Uh, you can see how the curve of the building is really uh, following the lines of this uh, kind of strange frontage that we do have. Uh, and in fact, I think you can all figure that out that from a, a design perspective, it's a very challenging uh, shape of a site, uh, given how the uh, small amount of actual frontage. That line right across there is only uh, 45 feet wide. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I should have made a few more comments, uh, just so, so you can see the organization of the building without going into great detail. That's uh, commercial space on uh, Pleasant Street. Uh, this is the main residential entry. We have units, that, uh, dwelling units that start along the back. They're raised up some because through our little park, we created a cut across, but we wanted to have, uh, make sure that these uh, uh, homeowners, or well, the renters, but these people were adequately up off of the uh, pavement so that people weren't looking right in the windows as they walked through. So we have uh, some units there and, uh, and line them along the back. The, the first floor, Apartments all have individual entries. We did that to liven up the street facade so it would have, uh, have a little nicer detail and have more eyes on the street. And we're really hoping that we will get uh, 
people who will find it uh, very pleasant to walk through the site, either to cut through to Short Street or, or cut through and come out on the play, cut through from uh, Holyoke. This is going to be the public entry to a community room. We're planning a community room that the CDC wants to make available to the public uh, for use. So we're actually hoping to see a lot of nighttime use, not just office hour use in the, in the CDC. Uh, the upper floor is fairly straightforward. It's a little narrower than most. Again, the site is kind of challenging. So as a double loaded building, it's actually a little bit narrower than most. You can see we flipped the units up there sideways uh, so that we could narrow up the building to make sure we could fit parking along the back. And also, uh, you know, when you kind of the first thing on the block, as far as you know, looking ahead to when there might be denser development, uh, you don't really know what's going to happen. We know the guidelines and we know the zoning, so we know what could happen to the west of us. So we did pull our building back enough so that uh, to ensure that if this, if these areas ever do get more densely developed, that our residents will still have plenty of air and light into their apartments. Uh, these are the, uh, the major facades of the building. This is, uh, of course, we've removed the other buildings uh, on Pleasant Street, so you can see that. The, the main materials we're using, and I did bring a board, um, which, you want me to show you the material board? Okay. We haven't 100% selected colors yet, but these are the basic, uh, basic palette of materials. I'll point them out here first and then I can show you where they're applied on the elevation. So we are using brick. As I said, we want to start uh, with using the brick color from our adjacent building, the little gable end <clears throat> building to our south, and then have a highlighting brick that creates the banding on our building uh, for, the, uh, uh, for some visual interest. The, the main facades will be brick and then a Luca bond, which is a very high quality metal panel. We're thinking right now probably something like this color. This I brought because it's just a sample of what the material actually is. It shows you that it's a composite material, but it's a lifetime uh, metal panel. For other areas, and once we're wrapped around, I think it's right to about there, uh, we switch over to uh, a high density cementitious paneling material which is what this is. I put two colors here because we're really not sure which of the colors we're talking about at this point. Uh, you see a lot of this material uh, being used these days. It, it, it's uh, what we're proposing is actually even a higher density uh, version of it that has a, a, it's a solid color throughout the material. We're looking at some of our detailing, creating reveals. So. Essentially, where we don't have metal panels, we'll detail a lot of the uh, cementitious product to look very similar to the panel material. Uh, most of the body of the, uh, of the residential wing, we're looking at a lamp siding material but made of the same cementitious uh, material. The, uh, a couple other things you can see on here, and then we can go to the next one. But we do use bays, as you know, along Pleasant Street. There are a lot of buildings that have uh, articulate the length of the building uh, using bays to cut down into it. In this case, we're creating a kind of attic story and then uh, interrupting that with vertical bays uh, within, the, within the dwelling units. <clears throat> but it's uh, very typical. So these are all four of our elevations. This is looking across the courtyard there. Uh, that's one of the entries just off the courtyard. Uh, but uh, this is uh, kind of our main uh, view right across the street, I guess, kind of from the where the beehive is. But we're, uh, the idea is to really maximize uh, uh, non-residential frontage, whether it's uh, retail or some other form of commercial. We wanted to really maximize that, then create this pathway that's about uh, 12 feet wide at the narrowest point that leads uh, the residents back who come by a foot. Uh, pedestrian off of uh, Pleasant Street can enter the building off of there. So we see it as uh, very carefully lit, 
uh, and to be a very warm, attractive space uh, and open to the public <coughs> as well. Uh, that might be the last one. Oh, no, these are some other renderings. So this is, uh, again, this is the CDC space. This is not our parking lot. This is the parking lot that belongs to the uh, eye care store right on the corner. So that's not our parking. This is the access into our site along the side, which is where you saw that setback. Our entry into the parking is back there. And this is where the CDC space is on Holyoke space, uh, Street. Uh, and some uh, constructed views here, obviously looking from the north. Uh, there's our sign band that we were lining with the brick building to our south. There's the uh, optical center there, and this is the former Brake King building. And then the view from the south, looking up, and you know the, there's the optical shop again neighbor to the south, and then our building and breaking. And I think you can see that it's a, well, this is what I said at the very, very beginning, it's really a prominent site from both directions, north and from south, north and south. And there's our view right down Holyoke Street. Again, we don't know what's going to happen. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, again, we, I think it's, it was very important to us to make sure that this building is pushed back far enough in, in case there is a denser development that happens there. And I will say that as, before we switch over to the site planning now, the, uh, we are taking a lot of effort to make sure we don't have visible mechanical equipment because we're very much aware that that elevation from, uh, from Pleasant Street looking to the east really is visible and so we are going to make sure that we have all of that uh, well uh, well hidden uh, one other point and I, I missed I went right by it but there was it was in the design guidelines another important point but it's come up in some of our meetings is people have been concerned about building a nice new building and then having air conditioners hanging out the windows and, uh, which we won't have it is going to be a centrally air conditioned building there will not be air conditioners allowed uh, we're using metal clad wood windows. Uh, it is important, I do have to note, that we're, you know, we're at a very schematic design phase as far as the, the real details of the building. It will be a, a very sustainable building. All the buildings we do at very minimum meet uh, a lead silver level, and we've got lots of ideas. Of, and we'll be, of course, who knows where the code's going to be two years. We haven't even seen the new stretch code yet. so. I'm anticipating that the building will be even more uh, sustainable than what you see built today in, in stretch code communities. So with that, we'll flip over to site plan to Walter and to Imad. Good evening, uh, record again. My name is Imad Zurain from Develo Zurain, so I'm a professional civil engineer. Uh, conditions of the site. Uh, the site is about an acre and a quarter and it's a, it's about an L, it's an L kind of an L shape that has some frontage on Pleasant Street about 45 feet and the biggest the bigger frontage about <coughs> 115 feet on uh, Holyoke. There's few buildings that's currently located on site and then the, the majority of the site is either building or or parking. Uh, with current uh, vehicular access to the yard is right off uh, Holyoke Street. One prominent thing uh, identified this site is an existing arch culvert that's uh, owned by the city. Uh, it's, it was built by back in 1800 and obviously it would have to be uh, located and we're working with DPW on that to relocate that, uh, that culvert. <coughs> As far as the, uh, you know, the site plan, as uh, Cliff mentioned, the, you know, the building is an L-shaped building with vehicular access pretty much uh, close to where the existing curb cut is. Uh, we purposely located the curb cut with, with some kind of a, a curve along the roadway to lead into a 41 parking spaces. 
So it doesn't look like, as you're driving down Holyoke, if you look into the side, it doesn't look like it's a uh, massive parking lot. Uh, we're proposing sidewalk all around the building, uh, site lighting, as well as uh, the two uh, uh, courtyard areas, one in this location and a bigger one in, in that location. Um, as far as utilities is concerned and drainage, uh, we've, we've filed with the, uh, with the city for the stormwater permit application, with, which we've received the permit with some conditions. And today, I think we received letter from DPW uh, with some, uh, uh, basically some comments, which we have no issues with them. They're pretty straightforward. As I mm -hmm. mentioned, the existing site is almost uh, currently impervious, 100% almost. We're reducing that, that impervious with some green space. Uh, you know, for the drainage, we're providing actually sheet flow into a, uh, some kind of a swale that leads into a, a rain garden that we planted up with, uh, you know, various plants. And eventually, all our drainage will end up in, in the, in the uh, existing arch culvert that, that currently all the drainage goes there now. We'll be proposing all new utilities, water and sewer from Pleasant. Um, we had a uh, meeting with DPW, and they do require we rebuild the sidewalk along all our frontage. So we're rebuilding the sidewalk along our Holyoke frontage, which is about 115 feet, and also along Pleasant Street. We're rebuilding the entire sidewalk, resetting the curb. Subsequent to this plan, you know, we, had, uh, we had a request, I think, from planning to extend the sidewalk on Pleasant Street. Uh, and we have provided a sketch that shows that. Basically, this is a, a revision to the, to the initial submission that we did. Initially, we had the sidewalk only along our frontage, and then now we're showing it extended uh, a certain distance, about, I think about 40 feet or so. Uh, we did submit part of the package, a lighting plan that uh, was uh, acceptable for the metric, and we are, we're, we're going to be using pretty much, let's say, their cutoff fixtures, dark sky compliant, and these are uh, sample photos of the actual uh, uh, poles that we'll be using and the actual fixtures. Some of them will be uh, in the parking lot, and, and, and there's some actually be hanging off the building along the sidewalks. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Walter just to talk a little bit about the landscaping. I'll make the comments uh, brief and uh, leave time for questions. Um, one of the fortuitous qualities of the site is that it creates a southeast pocket. Climatically, it's the most ideal outdoor space. It's where you get morning sun and warmth, and that's where we put the main entrance to the, to the housing and where people can gather. And so there are, in fact, two versions of the southeast pocket. The one for the playground up on, along Short Street is another creation of a southeast pocket, which will be warm early in the day, shaded later in the day, and protected from wind. So both of those places are pretty ideal for the outdoor landing places. The site, as already has been said, is pretty small. And so making use of all of it in a fortuitous way one of the things that we've done along the way, you may have, in fact, in your packet plants that show additional green and small pieces around the site. And uh, with any kind of pressure at all, small pieces of green tend to take a lot of abuse. And so the effort here was to, for instance, along the east side of the building, where you see no green, is to create the sidewalk and make it hardscape, where less light is anyway and to aggregate the green into bigger spaces so that we can, in fact, do a couple of things. Create enough space for some sizable trees, small and, and full canopy scale trees, to scale the building and the space, and to provide shade for the sitting areas and play areas, and to allow them to both survive and, uh, and uh, create greater uh, interest. Uh, Ahmad has already pointed out that we've done subtle things. It's a site where small things can make a big difference. The subtle curve to the driveway entering features the green, both at the end, straight ahead and uh, to the right, and at both sides of the entrance and arrival. So you're creating a green gateway to the project. And subtle differences like that march you away from the typical 
maybe motel-like or shopping center-like parking that's going on, even in a scale like this. And we played, as you might imagine, along the way with different versions, even with this tight plan of flipping the parking so the parking was at one point looked at closer to the building and driving away towards the railroad track on the far east of the site. And we ended up with the, recommending this scheme. They both had their advantages. But in this way, we present the building, keep sacrosanct the pedestrian space. You turn away, park your car, and walk to the building, of course, across uh, the parking lot. But it's not that many cars going in and out. Um, some other key things. As already has been said, and we can go into detail, this is an advanced schematic, but we certainly will have infiltration if we can have the budget afforded in terms of the paving as well as the rain gardens. And um, we are going to be using primarily native plants to the extent that they can be masked so that they can survive and, uh, and look good in all seasons. And we were, of course, will consider summer and winter impact. Um, there is amenity here, certainly for the users of this site, but also for the neighborhood. The park is envisioned for maybe even the school people across the street to come and use it on occasion. Uh, people are imagined to be sitting in this ideal out of door southeast pocket, and there are benches and opportunities for that being provided. Um, in a lot of ways, one of the things that makes me interested in and excited about the project is that it really is converting a kind of back door situation, the back entrance to the former lumber yard into a front door. So this entire property will no longer be the back space, but it is, as already has been said, contributing to the front space. It's adding depth to Pleasant Street. It's just not a facade any longer. It's a project that by material, by geometry, by careful articulation of space, extends depth from, from Pleasant Street back into the thing, very much in accord with the design guidelines that we once were writing for the for this plan. Um, those are key things I think that we need to say. There's an overall effort at fit. In my view, there's a critical mass here uh, that will allow vitality to be a part of the, this end of the street. And it's something very much in the interest of Northampton and I think all of the planning that goes on here. So with that, I'll leave the rest for questions. I think we're done. Um, do you want to start on, on your own in the architectural sure. line? Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was good to hear that you uh, took the guidelines to heart. Um, I do have a, a few questions. I thought uh, just for the general public who may not come to these meetings very often that I would just read the purpose of um, the design guidelines. A new building's architectural character should respect the existing historic character of adjacent buildings and of the downtown as a whole. Its character should be consistently developed throughout its design, articulation, and detailing. By closely following the design guidelines presented in this manual, a building should result which blends compatibly into the downtown architectural fabric. It is one of the purposes of this manual to encourage the creation of theme buildings and new construction for the downtown district. Achieving and maintaining a critical mass of theme buildings is key to retaining and enhancing the well-defined street spaces, which give downtown its distinctive, coherent character. Construction of new theme buildings is appropriate for most building sites in the downtown district. So there's a n number of guidelines which you went over. I had a few questions on um, on each guideline, or not each one, but a few of them. So um, you talked a little bit about the setbacks and about the pocket park, which I think is a wonderful addition. Um, I think uh, I'm a little bit concerned about the curve, and you talked about the awkwardness of your um, property lines, which is understandable. Um, but I'm not sure that the curve is inviting or creates a plaza that in, invites people to to have a gathering space. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, just the curve piece of it, if you could talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, again, I think at the very beginning, I was talking about the high visibility of that site from both directions. 
and the curve really helps you see more of that masonry facade from both directions because it does wrap around mm -hmm. and helps face further south and further north. The invitation into uh, the uh, invitation into the little pocket park on the south side. What we were trying to do there is, as a respectful gesture to our neighboring historic building, was really pull it away and expose a wall that's been, that, that wall was in fact uh, originally exposed, there are bricked in window openings on that building and having that be able to stand a little bit proud when you view it from the side, we think is uh, both enhances the, the original historic building, but also provides a little invitation back into that courtyard. So we, we did try a lot of different other uh, shapes for the, for the main uh, corner of the building. And really, uh, in the end, decided that this one really was kind of sending the best sign. It, it maximized our street frontage on a very awkward, narrow site. and. Uh, uh, gave us an opportunity to really use a lot of masonry, uh, we think, in a way that's compatible. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, is different from any other building in downtown Northampton, unless you can tell me otherwise, is the stepping back of the metal panel section mm -hmm. to, from the brick panel. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you're doing that in order to give more verticality to that's the building. Right. But exactly. um, it's not something that you typically see in Northampton. And, and in fact, the materials that face onto the main streets are supposed to be predominantly masonry. And um, I wouldn't call that facade or the other facade predominantly masonry. Mm -hmm. Could I add a couple of yeah, things? Yeah. Uh, the verticality, of course, is one of the uh, pieces of the guideline to emphasize the verticality. Uh, I want to go back to the anomaly piece. The building that curves, that's an anomaly. We've seen it in one of the other examples that was just shown. And that catches your attention. And the idea here is to really catch one's attention. But what hasn't been said yet is by doing this, the prime view coming from Northampton downtown towards the building presents two sides of the building really clearly. And when you see the volume <coughs> of the building, it has greater presence than as a facade. So there's an opportunity going on here, especially from exiting the community to really make this building a feature and draw attention to it at one corner, and then it immediately steps back into the orthogonal geometry of the remainder and fits. So it's the specialness of that piece of commercial real estate and that building and the visibility of it that's really working nicely. So adding only to what has been said. I think if you want to go to that view, the view from downtown Hampton, since that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's for no, up. Uh, it's further in. <coughs> oh no, wrong direction. The other, yeah. yeah, the other direction. That view. Yeah. So, like you have said often, that that corner is like the corner that you view from downtown Northampton, mm -hmm. and. To me, it's, it's, it's kind of a blank corner. That corner doesn't make a statement. Um, it, I don't think that it draws you into the building. Um, and, and the way that the materials change from brick to the fiber cement looks to be a, a flush transition. There's no stepping or it's just two pieces, two materials butting up against each other. Um, so it feels like there's an opportunity here for detail that's not provided. No, I, I see what you're saying on the, on the north elevation where the two materials come together. But, but if, if you don't mind, I'll keep talking about the curve a little bit more too because I think this is a view where you can really see that by pulling it back the way we did, you get a much nicer view of the building to the south and we let the sign band continue around as a way to be an indicator of where the pedestrian entry is into the little courtyard. What happens if you square that elevation off? First of all, we don't have the real estate because you saw the shape of the site. So if you square that tower off in the front, it gets very small, in fact, and the proportions really don't look too good. It's, we did do a lot of studies of, of, a, of more rectilinear plans and they, they really weren't uh, weren't doing the trick for us. 
Uh, well, let me ask why those groupings of windows on the north facade that are within the brick are stepped back from the face? I, it mainly just for the, uh, to, to create a greater sense of volume of the masonry. Uh, that was really the reason, to give it a little more massiveness so it didn't appear to be just a skin. You know, I think that, I think it's, it is important to think about what happens in the future, too, that we don't really know. I mean, where the Brave King is now may be put to very good use for as long as any of us are still alive, but we know what can actually happen there, and they do have a lot more frontage that could come up and, in fact, pretty much be in alignment with the corner of our building. You don't really know. But we're very open, and I'm very sensitive to what you said, too, because I think having change of materials is, is a real opportunity for some more uh, articulation. I think that's exactly how we should use it, is an opportunity for articulation. And I, I, if we can develop that design further where that juncture happens on the north side. Okay, and while we're looking at this view, um, which is one of the, in, in guideline number two, is that the street facade fenestration should be designed to appear to be at least two stories high. Um, and here, it seems a little bit low, although in some of your other renderings, it seemed higher. Did you yeah. move it up? Well, it's, it's been moving up and down a little bit. We're at about 13 feet, right? You are, you're right, it's a little bit low, and we can go higher because we can go up to certainly up to the sill height of the, of the first level of apartments. We're really trying, mainly driven by matching the, the line on the adjacent of the nearby building to the south. But I, I, I don't disagree in any way. I think we can take up more space with the, with the commercial facade. Well, it seems like in this view that it's actually sort of below that horizontal line on the adjacent building. Like that, you've started yeah, the band below that. I think it's because it's set back a little bit. It, I don't think it is if you look at the string on the ridge. But it, okay. it, I, I, I hear your point. And in fact, when you do look at the typical sign bands in downtown, many of them do go right up to the sill height of the, the first residential floor. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I agree with that point. Um, the guidelines talk about the, you talked about why you stepped back the, um, the facade so that you could emphasize the verticality. But the guidelines talk about um, building in uh, piers into the facade um, or other uh, details in the brick mm -hmm. so that there's some dimension to the brick facade. And mm -hmm. this is, um, it's, very, it's a very flat uh, brick facade with not a whole lot of dimension to it. Is there a reason I mean, why? The best way to understand that is to look at the building that's right across Holyoke Street. There's a, a building that does exactly what you said with some prominent piers and larger openings. And we were taking those kinds of proportions. Yeah, there you go. We had a straight on view of that one too, but that, we don't need to go that far back. But the building in the upper right hand corner is a, that kind of grid of piers. And we came very close to matching that, the scale of that. We don't have quite that level of dimensionality like that does. Those are proud by eight or, eight or 10 inches. Ours are more, ours <coughs> are only set back six inches or four inches. But there are no piers within the masonry. Well, There's actually, um, let's see, we should go to the front. Go back to the front. We had a few where we were, well, that's a good one. Yeah, so that's actually the side, but the, it's the same grid pattern. You're, you're right, they're not proud of the rest of the elevation. There's no brick that's set back from other brick. No, but w the guideline that we were actually looking at the most was uh, the discussion about the detail matching, the detail of nearby uh, historic buildings. And actually, both the one immediately next to us, and certainly one immediately next to us, is pretty flat. We can provide more articulation if we, if, uh, we really think it's beneficial it's, again, um, I think, I think it, and I'd also say that I think our attitude in the guidelines was was to try to not really imitate things I, and we we've taken I guess uh, uh, echoes of things that we see I think certainly having the you know lintels a clear expression of lintels of sills that was important uh, but 
we could certainly introduce some more articulation, but it, but again, I think we want to be careful about not getting to a point where we're creating a building that really genuinely looks like nothing that's ever happened here, or it's a, a weak imitation of something. So, um, in terms of the entrances into your uh, commercial spaces, there's supposed to be. Um, some sort of recess that happens at that location. Mm -hmm. But it appeared in the plans that the entrances were flush with the But lace. it's an overhang, the, the band around the corner is an overhang, so it is, a, it is a recess. It's not built in the way that you would build into a historic storefront, a recess that goes in, but the sign band overhangs. If you look at the second floor plan, you can see the overhang. With my pointer. You see Maybe I was looking at, at the plan view seemed to indicate that it was flush with the. Yeah. So this is a. This yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. overhangs. So the sign band becomes a critical reference for the recess in the building. It's almost like a marker. E. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th that's what I'm talking about right there. This is. So that there's a the sign. Process. So the, the pushback on, uh, on the right hand piece combined with the sign band. The sign band bridges across, and this is a recess. So there you're looking at that side wall. So we don't, it isn't cut into the storefront. There's an overhang that creates the recess. It seems like there's a, I guess I'm looking at the plan and not seeing that. Yeah, you don't see yeah. it. You have to look at the next Basically, level. you have your building up here, and this is just. So the actual entrance to the storefront is behind this line? There's a recess. It comes out like this. Or a, a low roof. Yeah. yeah. So it is set back. It's not set back into the storefront, but it is set back from the line of the roof. Yeah. Oh, so it's, so it's, it's a three foot overhang. overhang. Yeah, it's an interpretation of it. It's not. Okay. It's not that kind. Of right. It's not like this. Uh, no. Okay. Um. Uh, guideline five, which is about roofs. Um. So I understand that it, and apparently no, no roofs are are visible. Um. You talked about that large parapet, which has punched openings, and that Just is that. where I presume you're trying to hide the mechanical it equipment. Is. Um, but you, you haven't shown any drawings that show the mechanical equipment, and will you really be able to hide it in that location? We will be able to. We, we haven't shown any because we don't have the tenants. The, the mechanical equipment that will be in that part of the building is largely for the tenant space, so we don't really know what's going to be up there, but we're going to pay very close. So we, we can't. I mean, we take those guidelines. Literally. I, I actually, the, um, the punched openings is something that is not something I've seen in downtown Northampton buildings before other than the parking garage. Um, and I'm not sure that they're appropriate in, in terms of the scale of this building. And it feels a little bit like wasted space. I understand you're trying to hide the mechanical equipment. Um, but I also understand that there's concern about the perceived height of this building being too tall. And if there were a way that the mechanical equipment could be located elsewhere so you couldn't see it, would it be possible to bring the cornice down similar to the way that you have it on Holyoke Street it would be. without the yeah, punched openings? It would be. And, and actually, that makes it easier to mm -hmm. create the sight lines to hide the equipment. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit more, but I'm going to just read this section six on articulation. Um, new buildings or additions may be articulated by means of bays, turrets, recesses, columns, large arched openings, etc., designed in a stylistically consistent manner. Such articulation should be designed to be compatible with other downtown historic buildings, especially those which are adjacent or nearby. Please describe how this design is compatible with other downtown historic buildings. And how does it relate, do you think, um, overall to the context of Northampton? Um, and what features did you incorporate into your design so that it would be stylistically consistent? Well, I, without going back to all the design guidelines that I highlighted, I think we tried to follow it quite literally with 
respect to patterns of windows, vertical alignment of windows, symmetrical uh, patterning of windows, horizontal alignment of windows, alignment of some of the uh, features with adjacent buildings, which we did with our neighboring building, uh, large use of masonry. There is a section in the guidelines about use of ornamental metal and uh, corbelled uh, uh, parapet areas, percentage of the glass on the first floor dedicated to use uh, to uh, maximizing the uh, commercial frontage on the first floor, uh, the proportions of the building, making the vertical split so that we have uh, largely vertically oriented proportions as opposed to a square facade. The height of the building is consistent with the historic buildings. The setbacks we think are consistent with the historic buildings. Uh, you know, I think what we're trying to do is interpret what a 2015 theme building actually is. Is there going to be a lot of other buildings built up the street and in other areas in Northampton? So we're, we're trying to be sensitive to building technology, the way buildings are built now, and yet following the guidelines as closely as we can, making our inter modern interpretation of the guidelines. Um, the first floor facade, um, it talks about how there's supposed to be a bulkhead of about 12 inches and uh, no more than 30 inches on glazed facades. The south or Holyoke Street of ele elevation does not seem to represent these requirements. Why did you choose the, to do that? The uh, Pleasant Street side does. So what we did, we did that with metal panels actually as pieces rather than doing a stone uh, base, we used metal panels. Yeah, I see that you did it on Pleasant Street. I was wondering why you didn't do it on Holyoke Street. Oh, we can do it on Holyoke Street too. That's not that we're not way to that. We haven't we haven't really advanced a design for the uh, CDC. I, I would say one of the more interesting pieces of design that remains has to do with ensuring that we have. A, uh, and without going into too great a detail, this has to be an accurate entry at this because we want to invite the public into the building because it's a very public institution in there. There's actually almost a four foot grade change from one end of the site south to north. So the uh, whether we're going to make the, what's drawn in the plans now that are up for uh, uh, review now, we showed an exterior uh, ramping structure that takes you back into where the community room is. We're also going to be studying, and, and remember we haven't started the working drawings, this building probably won't be permitted for two years, so we've got a lot of time to work on some of these details. The, uh, we're also thinking about an internal ramping system. So I think the, the fair answer to that is we really haven't fully designed this yet because we're not exactly sure where the entry into the uh, CDC will be. And we're certainly happy to leave that open for future review. Um, the next section eight goes into a lot of detail about the windows, and you've talked a little bit about that. Um, I was wondering if, if you, if it, it talks about there being a symmetrical and rhythmic pattern to the windows, um, and I was wondering, you've broken it down internally. Um, is there a certain pattern to it? Uh, very much following the guidelines. So what we are trying to do is take the building at the corner of Holyoke and, and think of a way to really use the kind of powerful proportions of that building, it, which is why we, we did do uh, ganged openings, which exist in a lot of other buildings in Northampton. But we did respect the guidelines as far as window width versus intervening masonry areas. So I mean, the pattern is what you see. It's horizontally gridded and vertically aligned. It looks like in this elevation or rendering, is it's different. You had a six over one pattern in the windows. Oh, the Munton pattern. Uh -huh. Oh, OK. But then it, that's what we were imagining in most of the windows is a six over one. I, I actually prefer that to, to the six over one. The six one over one, one seems one. very residential. And if you do see that, that type of grid pattern, it's usually a six over six, or you don't have a a six over one pattern on a four story building, at least I haven't seen that often, if ever. I don't think we're entirely wed to the mountain 
Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about the windows. Um, so on this facade, I guess you've changed this in the the submission that we received. You did not have uh, masonry lintels or sills, but you would oh. intend to have those. Oh, we definitely do with that. Yeah. You know, I think again, without beating a, a, a half life points here, is that we were we really didn't think we were in the business of imitation. So we were really are trying to to wed. What we see is the future of the buildings that we're going to be reviewing uh, with uh, you know the beautiful history of buildings too which is why we're really focused on proportions and not really trying to replicate but trying to grab the things that we think are the are some of the best qualities of the historic buildings which is what i think the guidelines focus on the four or five really important uh, aspects of the guidelines well i i think um you know, I understand that you're trying to build something new in the historic context of Northampton. And the guidelines, I think, appreciate the, the historic fabric and recognize that that's what makes Northampton unique. And so um, I'm not quite sure that this building is, is <coughs> meeting all of the guidelines and trying to integrate into the fabric. I, I'm not opposed to modern architecture in any way, but I think that there are ways that you can reference historic features and still have a modern building, which I guess I want to talk about materials. Um, and and in particular, the, the metal, this facade and the other facade, where we talk about the front facade being predominantly brick. But in this particular view, um, it's about half of the facade is brick. and. I almost feel that it's um, it's a little bit too busy to have the, the 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 fiber cement and both fiber cement here in this case, right? There's no metal panels um, as the front facade. I'd almost prefer to see the front facade be a brick facade, even if there's stepping or piers. So it says this is the front and this is the the back. Um, I I. I'm hesitant on this board to approve something like this because that sets a precedence for something that hasn't been done before. And so that, is, and, and to me, that doesn't represent what the, um, the guidelines outline. So I guess I want to open up the opportunity to you to tell us why you think both this facade with the fiber cement and the facade with the metal panels represent uh, historic features of Northampton or relate to them in well, some way. The, well, I, I, two answers to that. One is that on this facade, it's actually uh, the next, from this, from there on, you go underneath the braid of the trestle into a residential neighborhood. So I think we felt that this was an appropriate spot in the references, it directly references in the residential. And I, I, would, I would almost believe that if it was inverted and the brick was facing the more. Uh, yeah, right there, here, here, what you're saying. Uh, but the metal panels, I think you know, the guidelines are clear about there being uh, the use of decorative metal panels. And ag again, I think we felt we were in the business of really interpreting the guidelines. And to us, using a very high quality metal panel is. Uh, it can be very nice. And in fact, I brought an image for you to look at. I guess I'm not arguing that metal panels don't look nice. I don't think that they represent historical character or fabric of downtown Northampton. Not as a facade. I, I think the reference to metal panels is more like a metal cornice or detailing, not a full facade. I just want to show you some. This is a, a building that we did do that combines exactly those metal panels with masonry. And it's the same idea of using some of the uh, uh, lintels and sill treatment so that there's kind of an unambiguous reference to historic construction along with the materials. But we really do believe there are ways to beautifully detail that that, that convey the same sense of care or craftsmanship and detail that, that the smaller scale modular construction does. Those windows. Show this down here a little bit. Yeah, sorry. 
these are the metal sections. Yeah, so these are metal panels combined with masonry construction. We've done it on, we actually uh, worked very hard on it. I, I think they, you know, it appears ahead. that on the Pleasant Street facade, the larger metal portion of the building, mm -hmm. uh, as you draw it, it appears very plain. This has more articulation in it with breaks in the paneling. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and this which, is a more developed design, okay. too. Well, I'm so just saying what you're showing us seems so basic and simple. I, I mean, again, it may be reproduction here and lighting and stuff, but I don't see any of that articulation on that. As well as the fact that you're breaking the window lines. There's only three windows on that. You see the window alignments are, the proportions change radically there between mm -hmm. the, the windows in the metal building and the brick building. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well, per, I mean, design's personal. Uh, I just find that section is such an anomaly. And again, not thoughts carrying also. on the brick materials. Well, we're Articulous. happy to work yeah. with that. I think you can see in other parts of the building where we are creating shadow lines with the materials. It's, uh, you know, right. these are not the... Uh, not fully and just yeah. just one comment I have. I mean, the, the curved facade building, you know, is a very strong geometric form, which I'm not opposed to. Um, I personally have an issue with the striped brick. I mean, it's so uniform and very decorative. I think it detracts from the strength of the form of the of the, the geometry of the building. Uh, it just I, I have a truly have an issue with the stripes. They're just so uniform. Uh, they kind of look like an attempt at poor postmodernism or something. I, I just I don't think they're needed when you have <laughs> such a strong looking building. I think it's attractive. I think it makes it look kind of clownish, not mm -hmm. to be pejorative, but mm -hmm. uh, that's my feelings. Again, it's uh, I'm open to I'd subsequent review, there's no problem this, with that at all. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems that I see here is that you really have two buildings side by side. One um, recognizes the 19th century character of Northampton. The other is exactly. almost an art deco, an art moderne uh, interpretation, almost an industrial building. And it's the fact that you've got them superimposed um, you know, j just creates a problem with me. Um, I think that the uh, the curve on the facade, I re recognize you know, your, your party on this that you have to do an L shape and you have a very difficult corner to work with. Uh, I think that's creative, but I think the, the fact that you've created, in effect, two buildings <coughs> side by side uh, really bothers me. I think I would rather see, even if you have a setback, if you could carry the same masonry around there and create a larger, wider building. And then that would say you want to repeat the same type of windows, the same detailing coming onto that facade so that when you split it, uh, it really mm -hmm. looks like it's one building. And also, I agree on the, the horizontal striping. You know, that's you know, a Venetian, um, almost a, an Islamic characteristic that has nothing to do structurally. It's just decorative. Mm. I think if you used the horizontal banding, say, at the, the sill or uh, other lines like that, I think that might be a little more appropriate. And the examples that you've shown in Northampton do that, carry that through. Also, I think that the, um, uh, the cornice with those windows up there, you're creating a real Potemkin village um, structure, uh, and it really looks uh, looks bad, particularly on the elevation when you are looking to the south. Um, and also, you talk about uh, you know corbels and everything on the corners. Your your rendering does not show any articulation other than uh, you know just the the cornice band itself. So I think that if you take a look at downtown Northampton, uh, there are wonderful opportunities for creative design at the cornice. In fact, that's a, um, a Northampton characteristic is to turn the Masons loose and say, build me a beautiful cornice, and they would compete with each other. Mm -hmm. And you've negated that opportunity. Uh, also, if you, if you go back to the, the view looking at this as you're heading out of town, that one, that, one. Uh, that to me looks like a, um, you know, a Tuscan tower house. Uh, the, the proportions are just so vertical and narrow 
that it doesn't look like a real building. Uh, it really bothers me, particularly with the height of the parapet up there. Um, uh, I, I think working that, bringing that down, is going to look a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, you know, the, the stripes, I understand what you're trying to do, but I think there's no reason to do that other than, oh, let's put stripes on the building. Otherwise, uh, the tradition is to follow certain lines, mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you work with that. Also, um, the way these two buildings work together, uh, I, I think you, you've lost an opportunity to uh, bring them together with the same window detailing, and particularly if you continue the masonry around, I think it would start to look a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And so that's what bothers me about this. Um, and just as we said in, we were just joking about architecture school that if I turned in a rendering like this, I would say, or the instructor would say, A for sky, C for building. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hearing some consistent criticism. Um, it's my turn. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think Bruce put it very well. I think this is jarring because it's like seeing two different buildings. I, I, I understand that a lot of what we're talking about is personal taste and aesthetics. And so I'm, um, I, I think this is one of the, the weaknesses of this whole um, process is that it, it, so much of it is... is based on personal taste. Mm -hmm. To me, I think the curve is really cool. And I, um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, you know, it, it, it's an element of interest in the building and it, and it, and it, it, it makes it a more interesting looking building. I, um, I don't have a particular problem with the lines, but I, I would suggest that um, it might be more interesting um, if you, you um, uh, had instead of having different color bricks, had some of the bricks come out and some of the, so yeah. so that you had so you, you provide relief that way, which is a very common thing in Northampton. Um, I I agree very much with Bruce about the the wide openings here. I think it looks kind of strange, particularly from the as you the as north. you drive south. Yeah. Um, I I I think it would be both on the Pleasant Street side and the Holyoke side. I think it would be. A much better looking building if the if the uh, masonry st storefront came all the way around and even you know if you wanted to even if um, you know from this line maybe it, it angled back a tiny bit to provide more light into that um, space here I assume that's why you set this back is because you wanted to provide invitation and light into this courtyard no, and to maximize mm -hmm. the storefront yeah. and, um, but I even even if, because you have a curve here, if it angled, or even if it curved back along there to kind of have the whole, I, I don't know if that would work or not. It's just, I, I think it would look, it would be a much more attractive building if the whole storefront were made so on both this side and the whole other mm -hmm. side. And, and then the windows would be more consistent and, and having some detail up in the corner of the corner there. I, I think it would be um, a lot more attractive. And I, I wanted to ask the that do you have that um, thing with the materials? Mm -hmm. the, so I assume this here is that. It is that. Yeah. But the, the, in, a, in this section it's flat, in that section it's panel. And if this type of thing, it would be panel. Okay. I just wanted to get that to be. But it's the same the, material. Uh -huh. Colors in that section. And this. But this, um, this, there wouldn't be vertical lines that would go all the way across in these lines. They're broken up by the base, yeah. They're, they're, they're rows of clapboards, in essence. Uh -huh. There you go. This, this, is just, this is just like architecture school. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, we didn't have computers in my day. No, 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 I get it, I get it. I think you'd be convinced by client to buy more brick. <laughs> And is that part of the issue? Is that the brick is a lot well, more expensive than we are building affordable housing? Then yeah. the budget. So the brick is a lot more expensive than this stuff. Than the. No, no. Actually, the brick is not that much more expensive than that. 
that stuff. So that I think is that's definitely. So we're not about. we're not breaking your budget by asking. No, you you're to not. Do that. Not across the front. Because like, that you know that yeah, the whole building is brick would be uh, uh, <laughs> bad news for the budget, it. right? But then, so then you would have no metal panel at that point because that's the only metal panel. Yeah, well, if I'm very consistent in opinion about that, I'm happy to look at continuing the masonry. I think there are parts. So there's of metal the panels back here. No metal. No, but that's not, not there. It's not there. There aren't. But that's so, that's this oh, stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's that stuff. Yeah. But anyway, what I was saying is that, that I'm receptive to that. I think they're they're fundamentals of the building that we really. Uh, really are very well led to it. I wouldn't say it's the striping in particular. That was, again, an interpretation of, of uh, detail, of getting detail in a way that's achievable in 2015. You know, that's, that's what we were thinking, and we're trying to be sensitive to that. Does, does changing the relief of the bricks, like having some of them come out farther, is that, does that add a lot of money to the budget? Yeah, it does, but that's, again, I think mm -hmm. we want to do something that's going to set the right example. I think, you know, our feeling is, is that you're coming from that direction, that, that a building in this place, and, and as we continue to develop this, I guess, I think it needs to be a good preparation for, what, for all the theme buildings and more contiguous mm -hmm. theme buildings. Mm -hmm. This isn't contiguous with any other building yeah. right now, but in 20 years, it may well be. But I think if you take a look at the uh, new <clears throat> police station in town, I think the way they've articulated the, uh, the masonry, uh, the brickwork on the walls, creating shadows with different patterns and all that, yeah. I, I think that that's worth a, an example uh, of uh, you know, <coughs> contemporary design in what is, in effect, a historic context without being a historic district. Yeah. And I think, too, the presentation we saw last month with HAP Housing did an excellent presentation on uh, modern architecture and yeah. historic uh, representation, mm -hmm. blending the two together. So it's possible. Mm -hmm. no, I know that I, it, it looked like the bottom of this was aligned with the sign on the floor, yeah. on the building next door if the top of I'm sorry it looked like the top of this was aligned the with the sign yeah if the bottom of this was aligned with it then I think you we would, have enough you'd have you achieved what you want to do of, of um, being lined up with your neighboring building but having this at a more attractive height mm -hmm. that's another that suggestion yeah well we do have space with the windows up um, do we have any say in views from Holyoke Street? Yeah, it's all in the CV district, so okay. the facades are important. I mean, so it sounds like you, um, it sounds, although I've heard from Barry, that it sounds like um, the, um, at least on the facades for the street fronts, that you'd like to see a change so that there's brick material for both those facades. But yes, mm -hmm. the both street frontage is in the CB district. Well, I guess I'm talking about the actual um, facade that's running along the railroad tracks. Will you see Will you see that yeah. facade from Holyoke Street as you're coming down? Not much. There's There's a very large window which seems to be um, a window pattern that's different from any other window pattern on that facade, and I was curious why. That, that very large window bay, which White. is different oh, yeah. from all the other window bays. That's, it's over a double entry into two of the units, that's why. Um, it, I think what, it just seems like a lot a lot of glazing at that. It's just out of proportion from everything else on the building. And we should probably show you some views of that, what you'll actually see. From from what you would see. Yeah, yeah we And then while that. we're on this view, it appeared like there's this little bump out on the side of the building that's one story high that doesn't quite integrate. It's hard to tell because we don't have a three-dimensional view, but that... Right, that's the extension of the... The reason we did that was to create more uh, non-residential use and the block to move back into the parking area. We wanted to constrict the driveway, so we pulled that across and used up as much street frontage as we could. So that's... That's why that's there. I think it would be helpful to see that in, in three dimensions because 
it, it just felt a, it feels a little bit awkward right there. You're talking about that little bump out right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the extension of the, of the commercial space. Of those three windows that you're looking at on the left there? Yeah, right. It looks out to the parking, to the driveway entry. What is the function of what's in that room? Right that is uh, the, the uh, Valley CDC has removed their offices into there. And as I said, it was both to create more of the space there, but also to constrict the driveway to limit the views back into the parking area. I just want to, Barry, did you have anything you wanted to say? No, I'm not needing to take up any more time. Okay. You, you've I'm, covered it well. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the more susceptible to a mix of contemporary. I mean, I think that buildings of this century should look like they're of this century and yet have respect for the historical context. And so I probably wouldn't go as far as you, but I don't have any problem with anything that's been presented. I guess I just wanted to say that I, um, I, w I went through each of these items because I, I felt like um, perhaps the design team did not uh, review the guidelines as thoroughly as I thought you should have. But I think what I'm hearing more is that it was a different interpretation. You definitely looked at the guidelines. How we interpret them is different. Um, I, I do want to say that I'm I'm very excited about the potential of, of development of this site and fully in favor of it happening. Um, and I think I'm I'm grateful that Valley CDC is taking on this heroic effort. Um, and I think it can be a really exciting development. And and even though I brought up a lot of details. Um, I also understand that this is a schematic design and you have a lot of work to do. And I just, I want you to hear what we have to say and I want you to hear what the community has to say um, because we want it to be a loved building in, in the neighborhood. And um, so I'm grateful in fact that this hearing remains open so that we get to hopefully see some of that integrated in the next review. Well, we uh, truly value your criticism. <laughs> <laughs> we, I find buildings really do get better when more people comment on them. So. Are, are we going to yeah. care a lot about this six over one versus the divided in four window? I think they're going to come back with a lot of different changes. So yeah. I don't think we're making any. Yeah, I mean, I think they heard what okay. your comments were, and I think the planning board probably wants to weigh in. <laughs> that was so tough. Thank you. Okay. But they don't have to talk to me at least. Or they can talk to the engineers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we open up to the public, the planning board um, has some questions, I assume. Uh, ours is a site plan review. It's not a special permit. So the, the nature of our questions is, is uh, much more straightforward. Zoning, setbacks, height, and so forth. Uh, all the zoning requirements have been met by the applicant, uh, but we still have an opportunity to ask some questions. So, with that being said, who has questions? Yep. I'll start. Um, I'm curious how many bike racks, uh, the capacity of bike racks that you're providing? There are, currently, there are 30, or if we change the nature of our thought, it could be 36. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Um, there's no drain shown under the play area, yet the play area is designated as infiltrating stormwater. So, the area around it will be uh, underneath under the play area. area. Which play area? Uh, and short, short Street. On oh, Short Street? Short Street. Mm -hmm. There's a rain garden uh, that connects to a drain. All right, well, is it's it just something that I noticed that, that caused me concern that underneath the play area itself. Uh, uh, sheets flow into the will sheet flow into the rain garden. Okay. Okay. It will be sloped, handicap accessible obviously into the uh, rain garden, and then there'll be a drain in the rain garden to go into the uh, uh, the culvert. Okay. Um, I do like that you've limited the grass area to a small portion at the picnic area, and you're using native ground cover. I think that's a, a good uh, feature. Um, your plans mention that, that you might choose to capture roof runoff and AC condensate for irrigation use. So what would be the factors that would determine that? Sorry, I was writing down everything you said. Okay, what was the question? 
Sure. Um, your plans say that, that you might choose to capture roof runoff in AC condensate for irrigation use. Yeah. So what, what will go into your decision making? It would, well, it would be somewhat economically mm -hmm. driven, I think. The, okay. the condensate's not a huge amount of water, but and we haven't designed any storage tanks at this at this point <clears> in the harvesting of the rainwater yet. But we think it'd be a great amenity. Yeah, I, th I actually think the condensate would would be quite quite a quantity for that square footage. Yeah, it is a big building. Yeah, true enough. Okay. No, we're we're receptive to them. We've done it in a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am concerned about the the light fixtures you showed tonight. You have um, a concern? Even though they are full cutoff, you know, being able to see the light source typically causes a lot of glare. So, I, you know, I know we're not deciding tonight and you're probably going back to the drawing board. So that's something that, that I would ask you to, to, to look at again. Yeah, I think actually that should be a condition. We don't allow the light fixture itself. It's not clear where the light is, if it's yeah. in up in or it's coming from the bottom. It's, it shoots down actually, There's no, there won't be a spill. It, yeah. Right, but I think the issue is where's the, the Actual lamp. Actual uh, Right. Okay. Okay. Um, your site detail sheet shows bituminous concrete and cement, um, but no pervious concrete unit pavers. Yet your your plans talk about all the hardscape will be uh, pervious. So then I think I heard the comment that you haven't decided yet. It's an economic decision, mm -hmm. and uh, whether the uh, can happen. The desire and uh, every effort we made to have it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then lastly, the, the photometric plan, it, it didn't show the foot candles at the property line. So, and I don't know them well enough to know. Like you, you kind of contained it within the hardscape. It, it drops, at the property, it drops down to point 0.1. Point, yeah, I think it's so supposed to which, be zero, but. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I would say if, if you know, if it when it comes to us for for a vote, that would be important we, to know. The receptors are, and obviously we have the railroad on this side, which is higher than us. Mm -hmm. we, this is the building, and then we have Short Street on this side, and actually the abutter in this location is asking us to a bit more add a fixture so he could get light on his property. But I think that's a good zoning, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Who else has questions? Oh, <clears throat> I don't have any question. I think uh, questions. I, I think it um, the plan satisfies the zoning requirements, makes um, good use of a very difficult site. I'm, <clears throat> I don't know whether this comment is appropriate, but I'm just I've been sitting here being very puzzled at the review by um, our colleagues uh, in, on the architectural committee. Just a month ago, we approved, both committees approved the half housing that was five stories, not four stories, and was masonry in the front and had what appeared to me personally as being very inexpensive prefab panels along both sides. And the architect there justified it by saying they're doing affordable housing and it's cheaper, but yet that project was partially market rate and this is entirely uh, affordable. Um, and I don't understand, it, the other HAP project just didn't seem to be subjected to the rigorous point-by-point -point critiques and comparison to the design guidelines that <coughs> this one was. Even though to me, as I say, maybe I'm missing the architectural fine points of it, but it seems to be very similar in its use of materials. So I've, I've just been trying to figure out why the review seems so different. Um, we've covered the things that apply to zoning, so I mean there's no particular questions here. I applaud you for all of the bike racks. That's way beyond what would have been needed. I think you're looking forward to what I hope that housing stock does, which is integrate into downtown and, mm -hmm. and not be reliant on the cars. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't have to do as much parking as you did. We thank you for it. It, it needs to get us from here to next century. Um, 
Um, I think you're, the, the extra green space that you've got for snow storage will be advantageous. And it's it's going to be a problem moving everything around on such a tight property. Um, I did have a question about park as drainage, so thank you. Um, that's it. Um, I just have a couple of housekeeping questions. Snow removal, it's a, it's a tough site, um, and you are advocating kind of the... the Basically, you know, we, have, we, we could store snow in this location, in this location, and also in the winter, obviously, the playground and play area won't be used, so we could snow, we could store snow in this location as well. So for the amount of parking that we show, uh, I think uh, the snow store. How about that you're advocating a pedestrian cut through between Holyoke and Pleasant, and I uh, envision because of the geometry of the, of the buildings next to each other. Um, along the sidewalk. In, in the internal. Oh, internal, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're on the one hand promoting that as a cut through pedestrian wise in the winter, I can see that just filling up with snow. Do you have plans to remove the snow in that area? Or? Well, the snow will be cleared off the sidewalk, obviously. Okay. So, you know, there'll be potentially uh, room for snow storage in this location here, you know, where there's seedings and what have you. So those won't be used in the winter. Similarly, in this play area as well. Are those considered uh, public sidewalks, even though? The the, yeah. No, those are private. So could we make that a condition to keep them cleared? I mean, right. it would make sense that yeah. you want to keep them I mean, they, they need to be cleared for, right. the, for the residents, obviously. Right, right. You could also have a condition about, I mean, you know, keeping pedestrian, all the pedestrian access ways cleared. So mm -hmm. if they can pile up the snow and create tunnels right. and they want to do that, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, last question. Are there any building lights on around the perimeter, on the building itself? There, there will be. There will be. Do, we, do you know what the fixtures are going to look like? Similar where we show, uh, similar to the, uh, to the uh, parking lot lights, the one on the top right there, mm -hmm. that will be on the building. So Again, these more for, for the sidewalk lighting. Okay. Same issue with that about the lamp place. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that. And when the lights turn off at night, you know, we don't want them necessarily on all night. Uh, so, okay. Any other questions? Ready for uh, public comment? Okay, we're an hour and a half into the presentation. We're ready for public comment. Uh, so, just a couple, uh, not ground rules, but uh, points of note. There, we uh, are in receipt of a couple uh, correspondences um, from abutters and people uh, that have voiced their concern. Um, both items, I think, have, have been touched on a, a little bit tonight. One is the amount of, or lack thereof, of commercial space at the first floor. And from a zoning standpoint, the applicant has met the minimum requirement. So from a, from a planning board uh, point of view, we can't mandate that they have more than, that they've, than has been presented. The, the applicant seems receptive to that potentiality down the line, but it's, it's, it's not something that, that needs to or should be debated tonight. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out, and, and if, if that's a concern of yours and you want to voice your opinion, that's great, but I, there shouldn't be a lot of back and forth uh, because that condition has been, has been met. Um, there's also been uh, comments or concerns about, and it was touched on briefly in the uh, presentation, as you're looking at the, the property from Pleasant Street, there's a, there's a property on the, the piece of property on the left where there's an easement. Um, what happens between the street and the back of that little funky little piece of property might be in question at this point, but at the street side where the city has uh, purview, uh, they've requested and the applicant has, um, has shown that the, the curb cut for, I think it's 25 feet or something like that, is gonna be closed with, with granite um, and that sidewalk will be continued, to, you know, that, that detail will be continued around the building. So again, from a zoning standpoint, that regulation has been has been satisfied and again that's not really something that that we should debate tonight that's not in our purview to do that uh, again nothing's going to be decided tonight we've got a, a couple more hearings after this um, the applicant I think has some homework to do um, in responding to some of the questions that have come up so what we're going to do we're going to jump in if you could raise your hand come to the podium give your name and address address the 
the two boards will we'll hear a bunch of comments and then we'll give the applicant a chance to respond after we get a couple comments under our belt. It's, it's not going to be a give and take all the way through. Um, if somebody ahead of you has made a statement that you agree with, since it is 8.30 and we have six more items after this uh, hearing, um, we want to hear what you have to say, but just, just say I agree with Mrs. Smith or Mr. Johnson or, or so forth. We don't, you don't need to repeat everything that's been said before, but again, we want to hear your opinion and we appreciate uh, that you're here. So with that being said, why don't we jump in and yes. Thank you. It's been a long time since I've stood up in this room. I'm Rutherford Platt, 78 Hillcrest in Florence, and I have an office in uh, Jordy Harrell's building on short, One Short Street. I, I'm very much in favor of this project. I think it's a great reuse of that derelict lumber site. However, please be aware of the traffic problem down on Pleasant Street. It is horrible, especially with early daylight right now. You may, the city may well need to install a light at Holyoke. I'm glad that the access to and from this project is on Holyoke Street, not Pleasant Street, but it is still horrendous getting in and out of, of uh, Pleasant Street. Uh, secondly, the pedestrian uh, aspect of Pleasant Street is totally unpleasant. Uh, I'm talking about walking between the side of these two buildings, the HAP and the uh, CAC, up to the center of town, and I do that walk frequently. I did this afternoon. The sidewalk is very narrow. It's, it's blocked by various obstacles, parking meters, signs, tables, whatever, at Sylvester's. It is broken up. The pavement is t very uneven. Uh, the tree roots have heaved up brick planter areas. I don't know how wheelchairs can negotiate it. So with more and more people walking up and down Pleasant Street, and I hope they will, uh, we need more sidewalk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I'm Amy Royal. I'm an owner at 236 Pleasant Street as well as 270 Pleasant Street. I had submitted a letter in advance of this meeting with the expectation that this meeting would not go forward as it's premature. And I continue to state my objection in that regard. I had a meeting with the CDC as well as the architect and was specifically told at that meeting and acknowledged by the architect that their plans that are submitted before the city encroach on my property. I have since learned this was acknowledged by the architect at a meeting that my business partner attended as well as my law partner. It's premature to be talking about design and reviewing plans and discussing them and hearing about plans when these plans that are before the city cannot go forward. I will also note that this picture that the CDC continues to present as the rendering of this building is impossible given the design, given the uh, constraints of the dimensions of this property. The architect acknowledged this to me at a meeting last week. This is a very misleading representation acknowledged by the CDC's own architect. Where is my building 270 Pleasant here? You can't possibly construct this with this rendering and have this entryway and then have my building at 270 Pleasant. So I want to make sure that those are on the record as well as um, I did here that the planning board does not want to talk about the curb cut and that's fine but I just want to put the city on notice that if that impacts me there will be action that I'll have to take if that uh, is cl closed on that site so thank you thank you yep in the back I'm Mac Everett I live at 40 Valley Street in that neighborhood behind Holyoke Street and I want to uh, pick up on a comment that Mr. Platt made. Uh, I serve on the Ward 3 Traffic Calming Committee, and over the years we've had lots of anecdotal stories about people trying to cross Pleasant Street at the Holyoke intersection and um, having near misses. Uh, and it, it gets back to 
the bend in the road that we started the conversation with, the visibility is not that great. People are accelerating as they go out of town. People are coming off the highway and in some cases still going at highway speeds. So I think a, bit, a really important part of this project is going to be to take a really serious look at that particular crosswalk and because uh, it's, it's already very dangerous. Thank you. Mac. Has it, Matt Mack, yeah. has it mattered after we removed the parking place? We, we took out one parking place. I think that helped. Okay. I think that helped, but there's, there's still an issue there. Um, and we haven't really, you know, for a while we had a paddle there, but we had to take that down because the towing company needed to turn cranes and trucks in there and so forth. So it's, I think that that move did help, but okay. it's, it's still an issue. And with 55 units going in there and more people crossing, I can see it being more of an issue. So. Not. Yep. I'm Jordy Harold, and uh, I live at Three Massasoit Avenue, but I'm an abutter to the project on Short Street, where I've uh, owned since 1986. And before I read what I've written, because I don't always speak well in public, um, I want to say that the the notion of that there's been a lot of public opportunity for public input into the publicly funded project um, doesn't ring exactly true to me because the real request for public input came in October of 2014 uh, when essentially this rendering was presented and some feedback was sought on it, which is very different than saying what kind of project will work best in this part of the town and, and what stakeholders and what abutters can we get input from. So I just want to say that and that kind of informs the remarks I was going to make. The other thing that informs the remarks is that we talk about um, <clears throat> the 45 feet of frontage on Pleasant Street that the project has or the 115 feet of frontage on Holyoke Street and the project shares a 225 foot perimeter with Short Street and its continuation and that's not discussed a lot in here but is very both visible in the approach from north to south to the building, extremely visible, and it also um, uh, Im impacts the immediate abutters significantly. And um, I've reached out very early on to the CDC to talk about something that might look more holistically at all the properties that surround it as opposed to answering technically to things in the, uh, in the, in the zoning. So. With that in mind, if, if you'll bear with me, this is maybe about a minute longer than its city council were allowed. But in the 1990s, I worked closely with the developer and participated in the public process during the planning for 228 Pleasant, which is now the Heck Academy, a project that abuts mine along 350 feet of property line. The early input resulted in a project that at least by degrees became more responsive to architectural vocabulary to neighborhood concerns, lighting was improved and the city's favorite architectural street lamp was used. And also, uh, through cooperation during construction resulted in an integrated landscape and hardscape encompassing our buildings and parking areas. And I was able to truly come to what was then the equivalent of this hearing as a supporter. And I would add parenthetically with that, that when that project, now the Heck Academy, was created, um, we managed to collaboratively uh, create what amounts to uh, a vest pocket, urban vest pocket park back there where there's uh, for what is a 10,000 square foot building and its, and its new neighbor um, much more green space than is being created for this 70,000 square foot building. Um, in, se in September of 13, 15 months ago, I approached the CDC when I heard they were planning a large project that abutted me and the proposed project shares, as I said, 225 feet of property line with me. I wanted to start the conversation very early, 15 months ago, a year and a quarter ago, so that I could come to this meeting in support as well. We met twice early on and I expressed my thoughts, but not many of them were considered in the design that was print presented to the community a few weeks ago or presented here at this meeting. The first thing that I urged them to do was to create a project that considered preservation one that recognized and participated in the band of 19th century heritage and industrial buildings that runs down Pleasant Street. Not to emulate certain 
iconic elements, but to actually participate in it. Union Station, the Yes Computers 19th Century Building, the 1854 Herrick Mill, which is my building on Shore Street, the Royals Eagles Building, the Keller Williams Building. The Lumberyard property itself contains a great 19th century mill, and it's the sole survivor of the tragic 1980 fire. I don't know how many of you were around, but that took down an entire mill complex on the corner of Pleasant Street and Holyoke. So we have a chance to uh, preserve that if this was brought forward in a different way. But this project proposes to demolish that rather than incorporate it. Second, I asked them to create a project that was sensitive to the context of the neighborhood and integrated with the streetscape. So again, you know, we are looking at a, in terms of, um, I don't want to, I'm trying to save time here, but we're looking at a monolithic building that from most of the orientations, as you looked at that bill, that, that view heading from, uh, from north to south, and as you look at it, as it exposes to Short Street, which will be open because it's so much higher than any of the buildings around it, um, dwarfs anything on the street and any of the neighboring structures. So while I, I can respect that perhaps another 20 years or another 50 years, something that size may come along, at the moment it looms. The third was the mixed use, which again, it has been touched on, but um, I feel t that I should reiterate the project is mixed use in name only um, because the majority of the commercial space is the offices of the CDC, which is a limited, and insular use that is not encouraging a great amount of street traffic. Um, when you go by their offices on Market Street, people aren't coming and going to and froing, helping to revitalize the neighborhood. It's a, it's a working office environment. Um, and lastly, learning from the past, um, the, one of the very first things I said as, as it became clear what this building was going to be is, let's look at Hampton Place. We have a, a monolithic building that ends up feeling very cold and not very integrated into town, even as it sits even closer to the heart of town, and that also features an opening in the streetscape that goes into the heart of the project with a very well-intentioned aspirational fountain and courtyard, which now, of course, is gated off and that never fulfilled its promise. And there was something to learn from that, and that it might not be a great trade-off for taking what exists now, the existing lumberyard showroom, as a retail space and taking commercial out of there to create what has, what could be great or could be a courtyard to nowhere. So I understand that I can have my great ideas as an abutter. Um, I also understand, you know, as a developer, how hard it is to put all this stuff together. Um, but I will say that I haven't felt heard. And even on the micro level, uh, the smaller suggestions that would make things more palatable to me as an abutter um, have been listened to, but have not been presented in this plan. And, and I feel very awkward because it's a lot of hard work to put this together. It's a lot of hard work to put together the funding. Um, it's a lot of hard work to animate a site that has had a completely different use and has been dead for a while. Uh, but on the other hand, this is the only forum that I have to say, wait a minute, I just haven't been heard and something very big has created shape without a lot of input from people, um, but it's a publicly funded project. From the CPA dollars to the state level dollars that are going to come into it. Um, and so it, you know, it's worth having that conversation on the macro level. Uh, before we go forward with the proposal, and on the micro level, just for myself as an abutter, and you heard even even here the simple issues. Short Street has is not over illuminated, but Short Street has eight lights running the length that would be roughly the length of this project, that help to make it a safe, inviting street at night. Whether that's for Roberto's customers who park there, for my residential tenants, for my office tenants, and the project proposes two lights, one of which is set back into the park, and the other light is supposed to take care of the other 225 feet of winding abutting frontage. Um, and while it's been said we can talk about that, what am I left to do but stand here and say, like, let's find a way to make that right and make that safe? Um, the 50% of the fencing that runs 
along the shared frontage is black vinyl fencing. And that's where it sits. And I don't have any other moment to say, like, is that really what the best that we can do? Uh, but to come to a meeting like this. The storm water is collected and the, the notion of a uh, rain garden resonates very nicely, but it moves the water fundamentally away from their building and pools it in a pocket. Hopefully it drains very quickly, but it pools it in a pocket adjacent to three abutters. Um, the, again, the, the project is building along 225 feet of shared, shared boundary where I have mature lilacs, I have um, other, other plantings, but more importantly, the project uh, theorizes that they will build along 225 feet of shared boundary uh, by very carefully and perhaps expensively, I don't know, staging their project so they never have to step foot on the other side and do things that then might knit things together and, and approach this a little bit more holistically. And I just question as to that, whether that's really a reality. And again, I'm left with no other forum than that because um, I have met with the executive director on two or three separate occasions. And although we've had conversations about these things, the general response is, well, the building isn't that well iterated and we don't even know what we're doing. So how can we say that we'd like to have an agreement where we, where we do those things? And yet part of what's proposed is saw cutting a concrete wall that is on the dividing line. Part of what is proposed is building, uh, if you look at the, the fencing along Short Street, is, is nicely proposed actually as a, uh, as a brick wall with some iron gates in it. Uh, how do you build a brick wall <laughs> without that, without working from both sides of it? Um, how do you build a brick wall uh, behind a line of 20-foot tall mature lilacs without having a, some kind of physical relationship, not just meeting relationship with the abutter. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, there just seems to be a certain, without being trite, community aspect, large or small, missing from the community development end here. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Good evening. I'm Bill Deal. I'm at 75 Gothic Street. I'm the executive director of the Collaborative Educational Services. Uh, we own the Heck Academy that Jordy just referred to at 228 Pleasant. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the Collaborative is one of the largest employers in Northampton. We have 600 employees, 180 in the community itself. And we run Heck Academy, which is a school for special education students. We're collaborative of all the school districts in Franklin, Hampshire County. We serve three six-member school districts, and they all send kids to Heck Academy every day. These are kids who, are served, who can't be served in regular school districts because their disabilities either are specialized or they're very difficult for the school district to handle. So we have special special education students there. And we're a little bit concerned that, that in none of the plans presented here, None of the conversations earlier in the whole development was anything mentioned about or talked about about a school being right next to the property here. So let me just speak for the children, if I may. Two, just two concerns I'll bring up in addition to all the parking and traffic, and pedestrian safety that of course affect the kids. But let me talk about two. One of them is the playground. You've heard this evening this playground is a green area, a playground, a rain garden, also the place for snow to be plowed up because it isn't used in the winter. <coughs> And it's also been mentioned in a different meeting as a place for cars to turn around. It's a very relatively small area. With 55 units, you're going to have kids there. And I really hope that the developers come forward with some more specific plans about this playground so, in fact, the kids who have no place to walk safely have a safe place to play on the grounds. I think it's a very important consideration, and I hope it is taken into consideration. The second thing is just Short Street, real quickly. Jordy mentioned some of the issues. For us, the issue is we have, dis we have buses and bands coming in from all over two counties in the morning and afternoon, and they have to line up on Short Street. So if we have 55 units with 41 parking spaces, and there's some people who manage to sneak into our parking area, our school buses will sit out on Pleasant Street and not on Short Street. And that creates all kinds of other issues. 
So we are definitely concerned about how we do we protect Short Street during both construction and when it actually a project is in effect to be able to protect that space for the school buses and safety of our children. So those are the two considerations I want to make sure is put on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Tom. Um, can I um, stick in a thumb drive and show a couple images? How many images? I <laughs> 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 can go through them very quickly. But somebody might have to help me figure out where to stick it in. I just need a USB port. I've done it before on this computer, but I, it's not my computer. That's upside down. So, if you could, you could get me to that. Is that it? That's not yours, is it? No. I suppose I could do without it. It's just, it's just. Bottom. So, I just, I just had a few things to speak to architecture and the CBC. Committee. This is Fitzwillies. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Tom Douglas. I'm in a butter. I co-own the Yes Computers building uh, just right up the street from this project. Um, I'm show, showing this, build, this project because it's a 125-foot-long building. It's all made of brick. It's a, it's a Fitzwillies building. It's a continuous facade, a continuous storefront, and a continuous cornice. I think that those are all great elements that are representative of theme buildings in Northampton. It expresses verticality, verticality perfectly well by um, the use of careful detailing and small setbacks. I think that it's, it expresses many of the things that they've talked about in this building um, so far, what they're doing with different materials. Um, this is my building before it was renovated. Same thing, continuous facade, continuous roof line. It's got a nice pattern of windows that isn't con constantly the same all the way across. The new building that, they, that the lumber yard is made up of um, four different elements. Um, Bruce had said two, it's really four elements. It's the brick theme building, it's the aluminum sort of anomaly building jammed up against it. It's got a projecting first floor retail space that's sort of like has a, a marquee sticking out from it and it's really a first floor projection which I don't even know if it's really allowed in central business. And then it's got the alley, too. So there are four different parts of this building that I think you have to look at. The reason I mention the alley is because it's a 12-foot wide alley. And you can see the sign panel there has, um, is really a projecting marquee. It sticks out from the building, curves all the way around. It's not just a sign panel applied to the building like the traditional Northampton building says. This is more like a marquee. It's got a 12-foot wide alley on the side. I started to try to think about what's the scale of this building going to be like on that street compared to other buildings in town, and especially what is the scale of that alleyway going to be like called 12 feet here. Um, you can see, let's see. So I started going around town looking at other alleys to see what is a 12 foot alley really like. This is, this is uh, Hampton Court, everybody knows about it, um, 28 feet right there between Sylvester's and Hampton Court. This is my building. I have a little alley next to it that I wish I could expand into and create retail, but I can't. 21 feet there. It's still walkable. It's still a decent pedestrian space. This is between First Churches and the um, Urban Outfitters building, 19 feet. It's starting to get smaller. Calvin and the bank, 17 feet. 
pizza place in the other building, I forget the name of it, 16. This is 12 feet. So this is 12 feet wide, this alleyway here, and that's what's being proposed <coughs> for this building at the lumber yard. And I, I think that it's very different than what is on the rendering. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I know that renderings, they, they, the perspective stretches things and it gives you a little warped perspective sometimes. They didn't show the, um, the neighboring building in their alley, so it makes it look like there's open space on one side where it really is hemmed in just like this. Um, and the other thing is, the reason I really want to talk about this is because we're missing an opportunity for additional retail on Pleasant Street. I think that 12 feet there, being devoted to a little skinny alley like this, is not going to help that, that um, street frontage at all. I think that we could really use more retail. We, could, we should maximize the facade of that building to allow for a more, um, more retail space there and not a little alley like this, like that. So here you can see the alley. It looks more like the alley next to my building. Looks like it's about 20 feet wide. Um, so I know that part of this alleyway is to get you back into the middle of the building so you can get into the lobby of this building, but that, that lobby actually has two entrances on either side. So this is only one of the sides, and it leads back to a little pocket garden, which sort of like is uh, like Hampton Court, where it leads you back into, they, there you go back into a much larger garden that's not used at all by anybody at all. It's a very dead space. And that's my concern about this, is this alleyway is going to be super, super skinny, leads you back into a dead space that's never going to be used by anybody and not contribute to the, um, the streetscape of Pleasant Street. Um, so the other problems I have about this building, well, I can talk, I think, the brick part of it is a theme building. I like the idea that they're, they're addressing the need for a theme building. I think that um, the aluminum part, I have a lot of questions about why it's there. It looks very arbitrary. I don't understand. I understand why it could be set back, but being made out of aluminum, having no cornice to it, having one single window in the middle, um, I don't understand how any of those things fit with any of the guidelines of downtown. I think that the guidelines allow metal, but not aluminum big panels like this. The other thing is the windows in the front of the aluminum building, it's just like a cyclops, one big building, no rhythm at all, doesn't relate to anything else around it. And I really think that those are sliding glass doors. That's what they look like. Um, if you look at it, is that, are those sliding glass doors? Because they have a little patio, like a little fenced balcony in front of it. And I think there's nothing in the guidelines that allows sliding glass doors on the on the street frontage. Um, the other thing is that uh, projecting canopy there. I think, like I said before, it's not a sign panel; it's a projecting canopy, and it has no detail to it all at all. If it was totally covered by signage, I think that it could work, but it really is like a marquee in the front of the building. Um, the point about the curvature. I think a lot of people think that it's a personal preference as to whether you like the curved facade or not, but I think that there are guidelines you can look at as to why some buildings have curved facades. And typically, a curved facade goes around a corner. This building contradicts that. It doesn't follow the street, streetscape at all. The, the um, examples they all showed about curved facades, the curved facade, like I said, went around the corner. This actually goes opposite the curvature of the street. It projects out into the street. It's a bulge pushing out into the street. And I think a lot of the subtle discussion about wanting this building to be prominent, wanting to be featured on Pleasant Street, are represented by this curved facade bulging out the wrong way from the street. I think that um, there's a lot of stuff. It, it is too tall. It could, be, um, could take up more space, provide more retail space, and it could pr provide a long, unbroken facade, both with the brick, and, and get rid of that aluminum, make it all brick, make it a much bigger facade with more interesting window um, openings. And I think that the, oh, the punches on the top, the punch openings under the cornice there don't make any sense in downtown at all. But one last thing I wanted to say about the, the first floor retail and that canopy space that's hard to tell from some of the renderings. You can see where it sticks out right there. Um, see where the sign ends, and then there's a little brick section there. Um, and the funny thing about this building is it has two real different retail set settings. One is this one that faces uh, Pleasant Street, and then you hit a brick wall. And then what happens around it, you can't see at all. It's not an unbroken facade like I was talking about that we see in many downtown buildings, unbroken storefront facade. This, um, 
it's hard to see there. There you can see the storefront facing um, down on the south end. So it's two very different facades facing two different ways, and it's arbitrarily created by this curving facade that is in contradiction to the um, street curvature. So I, the, those are the things I wanted to say. I think that um, it should be one unbroken masonry facade with better window um, rhythm, and I think the canopy is poorly detailed, and the storefront should be all one um, linked facade, not broken up like this, and not have that little single-story projection sticking out on it. And I think that the alleyway should be filled in because I think that it's going to be form, far more valuable as commercial space than it ever will be as a pedestrian alley. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. My name is James J.P. Korsinski. I live at 47 Hannabrook Drive in East Hampton. Uh, my family has owned property, and I, my wife and I now own property to the uh, east of this building on the other side of the, the railroad tracks on Hoyoke Street. Uh, We've been on Hoyoke Street for, since about 1920. Uh, it's changing. A lot of things are happening for the good. I'd like to see that. Uh, I can't agree more with Mr. Douglas and his comments regarding having the building begin to conform, not conform, to represent the neighborhood, to, to, to work with the neighborhood, to be part of Northampton. We have an opportunity here as a gateway for the city. Just so disappointed. This building, if you look at the other buildings in the neighborhood, uh, if you look at uh, the Gleason building, that, uh, where the DA's office is, it's all brick. If you look at uh, Randolph Place, the apartments there, it's all wood. If you look at uh, uh, the building across the street on Hoyoke Street, uh, currently occupied by Keller Williams, it's all brick. Fine details, architectural work, but it's all brick or one material. Here, it's a mishmash, in my opinion, of a variety of materials which I don't think enhance our gateway. That being said, I didn't bring my thumb drive, wish I had, uh, and Please bear with me. I'm not sure that you can do very much about this, but I think it's important for the planning board and for the city of Northampton's future. I'll, may I yeah, absolutely. leave the materials? This is a, my past. An example of. I just went out one there and it's a day. It's an example of what the parking is in Northampton. To me, parking is the key to the city, the key, the pillar on which Northampton survives, the retail, the entertainment, the restaurants. If you look at Kingsley Avenue, if you look at uh, Randolph Place, if you look at Michaelman, you look at Phillips Place, you look at Hoyoke Street up and down, Holly, I mean, not Hoyoke Street, sorry, Holly Street, they're filled already filled to capacity. If we're going to bring in 55 new units under the old zoning, I, I think it was two units, two, two parking spaces per unit, which would bring you to what? 55 times two is 110. And then you'd have space for the parking for the commercial. That would be uh, at least another 10. So now you're up to 120. And then you'd have some visitor parking for the 55 spaces. Uh, 55 units, so that, that probably brings you up to around the area of 130 parking spaces. Well, when I'm sure the planning board and the city council, because I know the planning board and the city council works hard to make good decisions. When you made the decision about the central business district, you looked at, what, do we want to tear down an existing central business building to build a parking lot for another building? I think that was one of the major considerations in approving the zoning. Here we're in a different situation where you have pretty much a clean slate of an acre of land, and you have an opportunity to make this gateway help Northampton survive for the future. 
was reading Bill Newman's article in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, his monthly article. I don't know if anybody happened to see it. He said MGM is going to eat Northampton's lunch because they'll have parking. We don't have any parking. As the zoning continues to make it such that you can't come to Northampton to do business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Caleb Langer, I live at 32 Powell Street. Um, I'm not going to speak to a lot of the finer details that other people have elaborate, elaborated on so well. Uh, but I would like to say um, that we're coming into the home stretch of uh, a project that's the result of tens of millions of dollars in investment to upgrade and realign rail service uh, through the Pioneer Valley. Uh, it's a, a project that uh, I think a lot of residents in the region, myself included, are very excited about. Um, and I think that Northampton is very fortunate uh, to have a, a location along that line. Um, if you talk to anybody who is uh, knowledgeable about that, they'll say that their primary concern uh, with the success of the project is uh, not the service that it'll provide, uh, but that uh, appropriate and uh, appropriately dense development is situated uh, within a key radius around those transit stations. Uh, and this is uh, exactly the neighborhood that we're talking about. Uh, studies have shown that the, the number one factor affecting transit ridership uh, is not even the quality of the service, uh, but the type of development within a half mile radius around that station. Uh, the, the federal funding uh, awarded for that project uh, was not based on a, an Amtrak Vermont train. It was, it was based on uh, at least half a dozen commuter trains uh, with robust ridership uh, to be financially viable, and that, that's why it was awarded. Um, a lot of cities uh, have done away with parking uh, completely within that critical half mile distance because expanding parking opportunities within uh, that distance uh, not only erodes transit ridership, but it, it uses uh, critical, critical space within that uh, really very small area. Um, so I, I think that providing uh, housing uh, of this appropriate density in that very critical area um, is absolutely in keeping with what this city needs to do to move forward in this century uh, with the transit opportunities uh, that we all know uh, are, are very important to the economic success of this region. Um, so a, as a, a very broad statement, I, I would say that I support this and I hope that everybody else will. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So the public comment uh, portion of this joint hearing is going to stay open. Um, I don't know that uh, at, from the planning board end we need to um, assign any conditions yet because there's still a lot more conversation to, to be had. I imagine you feel the same. Um, I don't know if you have a, a, a summary uh, on the presenting side that you want to address any of these issues briefly or um, I'd like yep, to Carolyn? address a couple too yep. when, you get, when you're all done. Okay. So. Uh, do you, I, I don't want you to go through point by point, but do you have any, no? Okay. Um, so I think you've heard what we've had to say architecturally and from a, a zoning planning uh, point of view. Carolyn, you've got something to add? Yeah, I just thought I'd throw, address some of the issues that were raised. Um, you know, the most um, going sort of from the most recent to um, the earlier comments. Just about the parking requirements, as you know, there aren't any parking requirements in central business that move from one space per residential unit in central business, not two. And we never had visitor parking requirements. Um, and um, that also, um, the concept is that you know, the city will continue, obviously, to look at um, public parking spaces and the fact that people just aren't bringing their cars <laughs> um, as much into downtown 
there's a lot more walking um, and uh, other ridership that's happening when in close proximity to the central business district um, and then in terms of say we heard comments about concerns about safety <coughs> on um, Pleasant Street the safety of sidewalks um, safety of crosswalks the city, as you all know, we're undertaking a um, study and possible, um, we did a, a mini strategic plan for improvements of the public infrastructure on Pleasant Street, looking at Strong Avenue all the way down, um, ultimately to the dike, but the first segment to Hockenham Road. So the city is taking um, steps to try to address those concerns that are well known. Um, the inadequate sidewalk space, the, the dimension of the sidewalk, plus all the obstacles that are in the sidewalks that were mentioned. Um, and as each project progresses, as, as we do get new development, uh, we work with applicants to improve um, those pedestrian um, features in, in as part of that project. So the requirement to rebuild sidewalks to a standard five foot width along Holyoke Street may only be a segment but it's a start in that direction. The same as on Pleasant Street, the sidewalk is um, uneven and different materials, and so we want to clean that up. And as driveways are not being used for properties anymore, we close those curb, those portion of curb cuts that, um, in, to ensure that the pedestrian safety <coughs> uh, factor is improved, so there isn't um, continued conflict between, you know, cars that might be taking a bad turn and go up into, you know, place it's no longer a driveway so that's why we require those closings when as projects come forward um, and then of course um, short street is a private road so that doesn't come into it's a pri private street so that's why the focus has been Pleasant Street and Holyoke Street because those are the public public streets in the in the district so just wanted to okay Ron, anything else on your end you're good we're good on our side Okay, thank you all for showing up. Uh, again, we're still open, so um, we still have a, a number of hearings uh, for the night, and so. Oh wait, you want to officially continue to a date? Oh yeah, time certain. So we need to vote to continue. Yeah, I move we continue public hearing. Yeah. Second. Second. To what date? January eighth at seven. January eighth at seven. Okay. Second. Guys, do you want to do a joint hearing or? Do you want to do a separate here? So, Mark, you need to hang on to this. Yeah. Thank you. The joint hearing is really painful. You put at seven and a half. We're still. You know, I'm surprised that the architect yeah. didn't point out that issue about the 12th no, right? driveway. I mean, um, no. Alley. Yeah, theatrical. Is. Thank you. Not accurate. I'd like to talk to you outside. Um, yes. <laughs> No, it's 11 point yeah. there, but it's that's what's up. Yeah, but it doesn't open up a whole lot. Well, Three, true. Six, that's nine. Probably nine. Probably yeah. probably probably not probably not attending the next hearing to quietly leave. It's all about what you can You can't discuss the As a, 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 a note to planning board members, the hearing is still open. Um, so we can't discuss this with anyone. You bump on to somebody at the market. Say I'd love to, but not until January 9th or the next year. Yeah. What's your? Are you trying to get out of it? <laughs> but you can't talk to him. Uh, now. Music. <laughs> I'll be it's about 12 hours worth of billable time on there. Oh, yeah. I'll recycle. Okay, thanks. 2015. That was the second round. That was the second round. Actually, we're just going to move to electronic, but some people still like to read. She's already drunk. Uh huh, for electronic. Gordy, I'll take one. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, we'll ask yeah. you. Thank you very much. For your, your letter? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks.
I guess this does take some artistic so. It does. Looks like that big wide plaza. Because that ship because sail. Because I don't think you that. see is more like <laughs> that. I mean, all of that's there. It's not wrong. You but you wouldn't be seeing it. Right. Well, the building, yeah, you'd see so the building next to it is, well, what, three stories? Uh, two and a half or something? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. But, but the thing there wouldn't be this. The thing I was most I still want someone to <laughs> okay, we ready for our next one? Yes. What's the easiest way for everybody to see the board check? Can it up, hold them? Probably, uh, probably in front of the. Yeah, in front of the podium looks right good. Yep. Yeah. All right, I'd like to uh, open up the next hearing. Scheduled for 8 o'clock, so we're a full hour and a half behind. Um, site plan for 24,000 square feet of new construction at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, 30 Locust Street, Northampton Map ID, 24A-46. So, we've got a presentation. All set. Hi, my name is Dale Teglanti. I'm with Laura Switzer, a healthcare architecture firm that's working with Cooley Dickinson on the Cancer Center Renovation Project. And uh, today I have Joanne... See with uh, who's the CEO of the hospital, Mark Devati, who's the CNO, and John Lombardi, wait, sorry, CMO, and John Lombardi, who's the facility director with the hospital. Um, so what we like to do I is just interrupt you. I'm sorry, sure. you were going so fast, I didn't get to take your name down. <laughs> it's Dale Taglienti. Okay. T a g l i e n t i. Can we just? Oh. Okay. Thanks. And it's 2,400 square feet is the addition. To the space. Mm -hmm. So to give everybody just a little bit of background, Cooley Dickinson has been working on this. So this has been in the works since 2005, 2006. One of the big contingents was um, getting the rehabilitation department to an off-site location, which would work better for its visitors, people that are going there for the community. And as part of that, um, just recently, the rehabilitation department has moved into the Atwood sites, freeing up the space for the renovation. To go into a little bit of the location of the renovation, it is above the emergency department, and what it's doing is connecting two pieces of the facility, which is helping us to support to achieve this cancer program. And I'm just going to jump to this one for one second. The 2,400 square feet is this area right in here. Right now, there's space over here that rehab uses and space that they used here before they moved out, but those two spaces weren't connected. This elevator core kind of this building comes into this point. So what we were doing is adding space here to connect these two locations to get enough program, which is the 11,000 square feet for the cancer center. And as part of that, the main treatment area that we're putting in there, this building really does not have any windows on any of the sides except for the new addition. And as part of that new addition, that's where the infusion and the chemotherapy will be given to the patients. So this gave us an opportunity to get some light into that space because those people might be there for four to five hours at a time, depending on how that all, their treatment goes in multiple days even. Um, so that's the little red location right there between the two spaces. And what this is doing, this cancer program, is bringing physicians that were out in the community, having medical office space and giving infusion care there with chemotherapy, to a central location. And this is in a location where the radiation oncology is close by. It's two floors below where the elevators are. It's going to have a coordinated aspect of this that will not only um, serve the infusion patients, but it'll be a cancer center portion of it. So any of the patients that are coming here for care, whether it's the surgical intervention, the first portion of it, or as they get into chemotherapy or radiation therapy, we'll have the coordinated space here that they will be able to go speak with nutritionists, surgeons, anybody along those sorts. That space doesn't exist right now, and it sends the patient over multiple areas. So that this will end up serving as exam rooms and infusion bays. And the big difference between this and what was uh, formerly the rehabilitation space was that the rehab space had patients coming in for 45 minute visits. They're probably overlapping, lots of covers. Right now, a lot of these patients might go to an exam room then go to an infusion bay. So there's a much reduced amount of traffic involved in this. These patients will be here for long periods of times. So I think it's a big benefit, not only for Cooley Dickinson in terms of their traffic and flow in here. These are now out in the community. That'll help for the rehabilitation. And um, 
this will really start to serve as that coordinated care. This is also offering up an opportunity if somebody comes from Mass General with a specialty to help out. It gives them places where they can actually see the patients and help bring that care to the Western Massachusetts. Um, also, we have just a few elevations. It's very a minimal piece of this. Uh, the glass is very similar to the glazing that's in here. The white metal panel matches the new surgical building that was done in 2007. And besides that, um, I think it's pretty much close to the extent of the project. Is there anything that I missed that you would want to include in? Don't know if anybody has any questions. I can go into more detail on any of the aspects of it. Questions by the board. And it seems a pretty straightforward project. It's within the footprint of the building. The only reason it's coming in front of us is because of the size. It's over 2,000 square feet. It's just barely over 2,000 square feet. And it's, it's recessed back in. There's actually structures in the emergency department that all comes in before. The big benefit to this was, was connecting those two spaces that would be detached and not being able to be connected. Mm -hmm. So it gives us that 11,000 square feet that they needed to achieve this. So how many new people are you actually drawing into this? I think it's less people because right now the infusion patients that will be here will be here for long periods of time. So it gives them the ability to park, not only go for imaging, blood draw, any of their testing that will be here. The rehab department that was here had upwards of 25 to 30 actual rehabilitation or a physical therapist that would work here and have patients coming in and out on a much more frequent basis. So this was really going to cut down on the amount of traffic that's in the hospital. Uh, you mentioned uh, parking and so forth and access. One question that came up from staff was uh, bicycle access and lack of signage at the main entrance to storage and so forth. Can you speak to that? Yes. Um, actually, I think the signage is the one thing right now. We went through the facility and found the different locations. <coughs> there's bike lockers that are back in here that are enclosed lockers. And there's lockers in the or, um, actual bike um, Right. In, in different locations throughout the campus. So I think that the big thing is just labeling those or having right. a better sign. To direct people to the storage, that. right? Correct. So I think that at the... I think quantity-wise, I think there might be a net gain that we had to add a little bit, but I don't think it was very much. It was just more of the signage. To right, say where right. Were. I think that's what the issue was. Okay. I don't see that it's any problem. I mean, I, I had a question if you really could do all of the construction without affecting any of your... And it, it seems that you Being can a hospital campus, we're going to do everything we possibly yeah. can to minimize the emergency department where it is, the front entrance. Everything's going to be as kept in close to the site and logistically worked out to minimize the effect upon anybody. And in the end, you're going to throw in a helicopter heliport pad on top? <laughs> I wish we could, but unfortunately, it's buried in the building okay. so much there's not enough. Uh, <laughs> that Yes. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to comment on this? No? I know exactly. <laughs> you needed a quick one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, your motion to close the public comment. So moved. Yes? Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, discussion. Okay. Accept the site plan for 2,400 square feet of new construction at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, 30 Lonza Street, Northampton Mass, ID 24A46. With, with, with the condition with the on the signage? You can see that uh, exterior signage is added to direct uh, folks to the bike storage. Second. Second, John. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? There you go. Okay, thank you, very thank much. you for your patience. Thank you very much. Yeah. Shouldn't we put it on first? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, except that so many people came for the other one. Okay, let's uh, keep the momentum. Um, I'm sorry. Next up, we have a hearing scheduled for 10 after 8 for a site plan for an additional T-Mobile antenna at 76 Main Street, Northampton Map ID 32C-17. Good evening. My name is uh, Marty Cohen. I'm with uh, Network, and Building, uh, Network Building Consulting. We're a 
uh, consultant uh, for T-Mobile to, as to its uh, real estate needs. Um, let me just give you a description of uh, the existing facility that we've applied for site plan review uh, to modify. As you know, uh, there's a f the facility is located on the rooftop of 76 Main Street. Uh, there are three antennas that are concealed in uh, closed canisters. We have equipment uh, cabinets in the basement, and the cabinets are connected uh, to the antennas by coaxial cable at this time. Uh, the reason for the modification, uh, and I'm sure you've gotten a number of applications from other carriers asking for upgrades. We have a similar reason here. We're deploying 4G coverage as well as uh, using spectrum in the 700 megahertz range. Without getting into too much technical detail, this is actually the spectrum that used to be part of UHF television. Um, and it's very effective for two things. One is the signal travels a long way, and secondarily, perhaps of more importance in this situation is uh, that it can penetrate building walls and um, higher frequency spectrum. So we find it pretty suitable uh, for 4G service. And what we plan to do here is simply add three antennas uh, to the rooftop. Again, in the, in, in the enclosed canisters, they'll be adjacent to the existing antennas. Um, and attached to those antennas, which you won't see, but, and they're very small, probably about a foot by a foot, are what we call RRUs. That stands for remote radio heads. And that's simply a device that um, strengthens the signal and acts as sort of a, a mini radio cabinet. And those will be connected um, with hybrid fiber cables that are going to run in the existing cable tray where we already have the coaxial cable. Hybrid fiber, fiber essentially uh, is faster transmission speeds and it carries data as well as electrical power. So it's an extremely efficient way of connecting the antennas to the equipment cabinets. Um, and that's essentially uh, what we're proposing to you have in your package. Uh, some photo sims. I personally took the photos. I don't know Northampton very well, but I tried to go in the surrounding area, northwest corner of King and Main, northeast corner of Calvin Theater, and then one other location, I think it's called Hampton Street, south of the site, which I think gave a, a pretty good representation um, of what the site will look like. And essentially that, in a nutshell, is what we're intending to do. But if you have any questions. Did you notice please. that we saw one of the antennas in the earlier presentation? Same, same building. Yeah. Yeah. You're paying attention. I know. Good for you, though. Uh, any questions by the board? Um, I've got one. Um, I'm looking at the diagram that just places the antennas on the rooftop. The plan, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what I care about is whether I can see them from the streetscape. That's my first concern. Okay. So I like the, the step back on the mostly north side and the mostly east side, I guess. Uh, I believe so, yeah. So the two that are closest to the edge are at the back of the building. Am I, I'm looking for a confirmation because there's no street orientation oh, here. Oh, okay. You know what? Let me... Um let me find the plans here so that we're talking about the same thing. C1. Yeah, I'm on C1. Just bear with me for a moment. I've got quite a few papers here. You know, maybe I can just borrow your plan out. Sure. You if you don't mind. On the C1. So the two canisters at the bottom that's the back side of the building right and I I think you'll be able to see the back side because there's uh, well the, I took a, fo a photo from what was that Hampton Street and you yeah yeah they are visible from here yeah so my, my question is pretty simple it looks like you could scoot those in some can you I'm sorry you scoot you could in some, can you? So that they've got the same perimeter s spacing as the others. I don't want to speak on a turn. I'll tell you what the factor is. Okay, and I think it would be up to our RF engineer. It, it's something that we call shadowing, and you can think of it as this. You've got, my pen is the canister, okay, and this desk is the building rooftop, okay. 
we have a certain amount of down tilt because we want to reach the street below. What you want to be careful of is it doesn't hit the building roof. So you have to be careful how far back you go from the building edge. If you go further back, then you need a taller structure, which it's a trade-off that becomes more visible. Um, so that's the concept. This is something I could I could inquire about, but we might have to go higher if we set that. Yeah, we went through this same discussion on yeah. top of right. yeah. another well, building downtown yeah, recently, yeah. and and since these are at the back, they're not. You're not getting. You're you're, you're not servicing the sidewalk. You know there. So I would just. That would be my concern, just because we can. If if you can move those in, they'll be seen less. And okay. We appreciate. I mean, I could certainly make an inquiry, and it may be that even just scooting them in another foot or so could yeah. reduce. Yeah. I, mean, I think if you're doing it on the others, and they're the ones over the over the sidewalk at the street. Right. That's all I had. I read this a few days ago, so I apologize if I missed it in here. But can you talk about the material that the canisters are made of? Oh, the fiberglass, because okay. that's an RF-friendly material. It's virtually, other than like wood louvers, like we sometimes use in church steeples, it's the only material that the signal can, can pass through. The advantage of it is it obviously can be painted to match anything you want it to. Yeah. Are these anticipated to be painted? We'll make them the same color as existing ones. Which are? Obviously. Hard to tell. It's sort of a, look, a sort of a they grayish like, carpet. Yeah. Right. Sky blue but, comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we want them black. It would well, we have a lot of gray days. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Recently, anyway. Yeah. When I was here, they looked kind of grayish charcoal tone, but again, in the, depending on the light conditions, I suppose they might look different. I mean, if you're satisfied with what we have now, and that would be our plan just to match what's already there. Yeah. Carolyn, do you yeah, remember what we did? It was it going point. to go on a tube down the side. Yeah, it was like a steel thing. It was whatever they presented. Yeah, you oh, the cable. Oh, right. That's already existing, what we call a cable tray. It's already there. So it's you're not going to see. You're not going to add any other. another. We're going to add a cable, but it'll be inside the it'll tray. Be you won't see it. It'll be already there. You won't see it. Right. So there's nothing so. exposed coming down the building. Correct. Right. Yeah. Nothing new. Right. 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 It's like putting wire through an existing pipe. It's yeah. not going to change the appearance. Any other? My only concern would be we, we can get them lighter and they're less noticed, and so I think this is the time to ask for that if we do. I agree. I, I mean, I, well, for all of them, he may. I don't know if that's under our purview. Uh, well, I mean, I just wonder. So I don't know if it would make a difference if some of them are one color, the original ones stay the same. You can't and see them. It doesn't matter what color they are. You, can, the oh, you, you can, can see, see, them. see some of them. Did we stipulate? We, when we had the issue at Thorns. No, I have the old uh, site plan review approvals uh, right here. Incidentally. And I don't think, it might have said just in conformance with the plans. Let me see here. You guys talked about color for the other mm -hmm. ones and decided that wasn't the way to go because, right. it, it, you know, it's more, it, it stands out more. Right. It's a color. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. thinking with steel or something. Okay. I've, I've had my request if you can. That's okay. Okay. Uh, should we open up the public? Mm -hmm. Anyone here from the public who would like to comment on this? No? Can I hear a motion to close the public? Second one. Any discussion? All in favor? More legible than the Opposed? No. Okay. Uh, any more discussion? I mean, I've voiced what I would like to have. I don't believe he can answer me if it's possible. Can we make a good faith effort a condition? Yeah. I mean, to, you could say you could require that they be pushed back. What was it? A, a foot or two? Is that? I just the without having to maximum. raise them. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you could require that they sh um, that unless. Um, There's limiting they service. Right. If they can't push it back, then they have to show why they can't push it back. Um, but otherwise, push it back to... As far as they can. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to propose that as a condition. Make a motion? I do. Think you don't want to say can't push it back. I mean, anything can be done. Without making it taller. Without making it taller. Without right. making, okay. right. Without right. making it taller. That's what I'm under it. I just want to be clear on what you right. want. So, okay. And so I can. Purpose. Right. 
Yeah. Right. So they could, we could, you could just require that prior to issuance of a building permit, they submit documentation um, about the location, showing the final location, and um, if they are unable to um, move it back, then show the technical reasons why they can't because it'll. Um, they can tell it without yeah. going taller. I'm just right. I'm, I'm swayed by the fact that the others are and so I just right. think they right. could um, I move we approve site plan additional T-mobile antennas at 76 Main Street Northampton map ID 32 C 17 uh, with the condition that all the antennas have the same distance from the roof edge from the front of from the building. that's a, the ones in the back have the clearance that the ones in the front have uh, notwithstanding that they don't get higher to move them. Second. Second. I think John got that. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. I don't know if everybody's exhausted, and that's why these are going quickly, or? <laughs> Just that easy. Okay, next up. We have a hearing scheduled for 825 for a site plan by Shop Development LLC for a 2,000 square foot uh, plus for four, addition for four residential units and two structures at 108 Grove Street, Northampton Map ID 38C-10. Thank you for your uh, power. <laughs> Is this a delicate table? Um, yeah, no. Black color too. That well, that's the that's the projector. We're not going to get much better than that. Okay. That's We're fine. working on a change. <laughs> help you. I propose C P C. Yeah. Dr. Palmer. <laughs> Hi, thank you for uh, hearing from us. My name is Dory Brooks. I'm a designer with Jones. Dory, Dory Brooks. Yep. I'm a designer with Jones Woods at Architects in Greenfield. I'm also a resident of Northampton. Um, Bruce Foles approached our firm uh, last year as one of several participants in the Small Lots Big Ideas competition that was held by the city. Uh, and uh, Bruce had a vision at that time of an alternative dwelling type in Northampton that would accommodate uh, both energy efficient building practices and modernist sensibilities. Uh, and he created an organization he's calling Shop Development Small House Opportunity Project, um, hoping to find uh, sites within the city that can be developed into, into new models of housing that are uh, appealing to the uh, urban lifestyle and, and meeting with the city's new zoning uh, attitude, which is trying to encourage an infill of that type. Um, we've been working for several months since developing plans for this four-unit condo development to be built at 108 Grove Street. Mr. Bowles owns VCA Industries, an architectural woodworking business on Earl Street, just around the corner from the site. He's familiar with this property and purchased it in the spring of this year and has been working hard since uh, to clean up it up from its derelict current condition. Uh, you may be familiar with the site already on Grove Street. Uh, it, it's been falling into disrepair for, for some time and he's put a lot of work into it already. Um, 108 Grove Street is a half acre lot located between Grove Street and the East Hampton Spur of the Bike Trail. The neighboring wetland cannot be developed. The property is across the street from Grove Street Inn and next to a development of small apartments. The, slope site, um, the, the site slopes away from Grove Street um, towards the south and towards the bike trail. So the top of, the, of here working in Grove Street, the bottom is really just adjacent to the bike trail. The views of the site then, because of that sloping, the, the site's really divided into sort of three terraces. 
uh, a higher, middle, and lower. And currently, the current building and barn are built on sort of the middle level. Um, the site looks towards the south, um, towards uh, the Holyoke Range. Um, and then, again, it has that wetland open area next to it, sloping away. Um, we've tried to use the design to focus on uh, taking advantage of the southern exposure and the views to the south um, that are so enjoyable in the site. Uh, the buildings are oriented to use uh, a joint driveway. So as you see, we've kind of broken the project into, even though it's four units of condominium, we've broken it into two buildings. Each building is uh, a, a mirrored replicate of the other. Um, and uh, the intention in this massing is to have the buildings themselves be similar to the single family homes in the neighborhood and not overscaling in the neighborhood. Each building is then divided into two units, an, a lower unit and an upper unit. Um, the design reflects some of the industrial character of the area uh, in its uh, materials. It's a modernist design. Uh, the exterior siding is um, galvanized aluminum and fiber cement board. Um, the, uh, the units, each building is 2,700 square feet. Um, and there, the bottom unit is a little bit larger than the top unit. And this view is the south elevation, so this would be the view you'd be looking at from the bike trail, generally speaking. <laughs> uh, this is the east site elevation, looking from, say, Earl Street, um, if you were directly east, but generally if you're, if you're driving up from the corner of Earl Street and Grove. Um, and at, at the moment, that is uh, fairly tree heavy, but there's a lot of uh, wetland in this area, so it would be opened if if you remove some of the trees. This is trying to show the actual buildings, really. Um, this is a site if you removed, if you were not looking at the trees that are on the adjacent property. Uh, there are trees blocking between uh, the apartment buildings next door and the site, but this is the west elevation. Um, and I'll come back again to the, uh, actually, I'll just flip back to that north site elevation, looking at it directly from Grove Street. I'll come back to that again, though. So this is the, the street's point of view. And then each individual elevation of the building, uh, just to go through these quickly, the east elevation, south, north. Uh, oops, that would be north. <laughs> and that would be the, it actually depends on which side you're looking at. That would be the uh, west elevation. And then on the other unit would flip to be the east. Um, so again, back to this rendering. Um, this rendering, I think, is, is indicative of the attitude that the whole project is trying to take. Um, we actually have a wonderful team working on it, uh, uh, including um, Kent Hicks, a well-known local builder, Julie Sneezek from Guntlow Associates, who's our civil engineer, and Craig Stevens of Landscapes. Um, Craig, really, this I like because it brings in Craig's attitude as well, which is a very organic landscape style. Um, so rather than retaining walls, we're using boulders, we're using native plant species, and uh, we're trying to really integrate the site and the landscape and the buildings as much as possible. Um, the um, carport um, houses four cars. So I can go back through the site plan if needed. Um, but it reflects the same style as the rest of the, build the buildings. Um, it does attempt to reuse um, some of the existing wood and lumber on the current barn on the site and uses them as salvage and then kind of incorporates that element and kind of integrates it back. Um, so that, I'll leave it at that at this point and uh, if you have some specific questions about that. Questions by the board. Yeah. So you've provided one carport per space per unit. So each, no, we have, um, sorry, to go back to the site plan, the, um, the requirement is two units, two car parking spaces per the downstairs units and one for the upstairs based on size. So it's six parking spaces. We have four covered and two uncovered. Is there a point or does this work at the point? Um, do you have the gray thing right there? Yeah. There's a yellow button in the middle. That's right. a pointer. But you have to point <laughs> at it. At it, right? Yeah. Right. So. Those are two parking spaces that are uncovered. And we put the, the um, covered area so that largely to kind of screen the, the parking area from the street. So. And where would guests or visitors park? Um, they would, there is some space here. 
Um, and it is possible to park cars along here if they were temporarily parked, and you could still back out based on sizing. Uh, I think ultimately it's, it would be the same as my, my own driveway. You know, there's room for two cars in my driveway and, and an additional. But at a certain point, if you had capacity, I think you, you, you could really only fit three cars along here, potentially four. But there's a slope, so you'd want to be careful about that. mentioned bicycle parking yet or no? Um, there is the parking. I uh, don't have an, uh, a plan view of the, um, let me see if I can give you a view. Um, on the, um, on this view behind, uh, on the side of the uh, parking structure, both sides, uh, both street side and the other side, there are vertical parking racks uh, for bicycles. So there's a total of of, um, if you look on the uh, design plan for the carport, there's some vertical storage. And then inside the carport, there's storage per unit just for each homeowner to have some private storage. So the bicycle parking is just integrated vertically with the, uh, the carport. So that is covered? For yes. The mm -hmm. Yes, it's covered. it's covered. So the, um, the site does hope to encourage uh, relationship to the bike path. Um, this is a, a path that runs through the site uh, to the bike trail at the bottom. And it's really the existing path that's on site, um, but we've kind of organized it and formalized it. But the, the grade's a sort of a natural grade that we're trying to work with. It's a dirt path. Uh, currently, it's not even. It's really just grass. There's a bit of a path, but it's obviously where everybody's gone. And there will be regrading, but it's a logical, comfortable grade to get down to the bike trail. Mm -hmm. And we don't continue it all the way through the site because we didn't want to make it a public <laughs> public path. Yeah. You had a strangely shaped path in the, first, in the front, in the first one of these that I saw. Uh, and it's gone from everything except the last, whatever the last one is in uh -huh. a second. It's, I, I assume it's gone. You no, know, it's an, well, we view it as an option. The, the goal, there's a, what we wanted to do is have an ADA accessible option. Um, for the first floor of uh, this unit uh, so that you would not need to use stairs at all. And that grading allows for that still in this area um, so that if, an, if a buyer wanted that, that option would be there that they, they could put in an, an accessible ramp to their door as opposed to having to go down steps so that they can get from this it's long to that winding. Way. Well, that's the only thing stone, that's dramatic. Stone or stone dust or whatever you call it. I think it that's this. That's this path. And I don't know. It was in the front. But we yeah. may have cut. We did I at some point might. show a little bit at the front, and we decided that that was not a good idea to have that's it. That's what I thought. That's what I Yeah. <laughs> okay. but, but then we did have this little turn there. That yeah, no, that was, it was, it was larger than that. Okay. Um, exterior lighting. I know the yes. photometrics, it's zero pretty much everywhere, but the lighting that is there, what does that look like? Um, let me, these are the picture cut sheets. Thank you. Um, they're dark sky compliant. Uh, the intention with the, the wall mount fixture is that it will um, underneath the canopy, it will light up to light the canopy. Um, and when it's not under the canopy, there's another version that does not light upward at all. Um, the step light did on the photometrics kind of come in higher than it's uh, sort of, you know, shown to be the requirement. But the, the, the step light is intended to be bright at that level. And it's within the well as you step down. So it would not be visible from the street even. It only lights towards the uh, towards that, so right here's a step light, and here's a step light. So it's actually a, a, a kind of a required light to really allow you to see the steps mm -hmm. from the parking area down to the terraces. So I, I don't think that would be a problem to glare. And there's nothing at the carport? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, the, the wall mount is also, there's, there's uh, a wall mount at each entry to the building, as well as at the back, and then there's wall mount lights on the carport, on the sides. And would those be on a timer, the ones at the carport, or how would those, would those they, be on all night, or? They could be, we haven't, we haven't gotten to that level of engineering, yet, it's certainly possible. I would think we'd want that, so they're not on all night. Right, and I, I think it's often good, potentially, to have a 
a motion activated light at that location yeah. as well. Right. Uh, snow removal, any, has that been thought through? It's been discussed. The, um, Bruce is recommending that he, he, he feels it's more of a, a snow blower situation than a snow plow situation. Um, there, it is a, a bit of a tight site. Um, our assumption is that snow plowing, you know, we have this gap here, you know, so that you can kind of turn and pull to this area. But I, I think snow blowing sort of does make sense to kind of push off. It's not a very large drive area. Uh, Again, I'm sorry, if the okay. trees are coming down for this process. Um, I would say so. Uh, I think the plan you see uh, in the in the two site plans, uh, a lot of grading is occurring, yeah. um, and we do have a plan that shows what we're bringing back. So most of this area, so uh, this is existing and will remain much of it. There's a lot of screening on this side of the property mm -hmm. between the two apartments. This area is all kind of remaining as is, and these trees exist and will remain. In this area, because of the grading changes that have to occur, most of this will go. Um, and th it's, the property line has a sort of a line of trees straddling. And some, a lot of, the, frankly, to be quite honest, if you look at the existing conditions, a lot of the vegetation on the site's in very poor shape anyway. So there's gonna be a lot of, even what's there is gonna get looked at in terms of its general health, because some of it would be healthier if you took the tree next to it down. Um, but uh, Landscapes has uh, put in place a design, I think it's quite nice, it um, brings in a number of river birch, um, service berry, and that's, that's kind of the, um, the feel you get here with some of this. Um, I th think I think we in included a, a plan from Craig that gives you some idea of, of his intentions. He's a, a real sort of artist who works with the landscape, not so much with his computer. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the landscape. And I like the massing. I like how it works with the, the elevations that are there instead of creating new ones. Uh, I think it's an interesting project, and it's, and it's well done. Yeah, I love, I love the design. Like, Great. I want to buy one of them. Um, but when I see structures like this and see those wonderful flat roofs, I ask about green roof opportunity. And yes, is that actually. Under discussion. It is under discussion. It's a budget issue for sure. Right here, these at the end of each unit, there's a, a low little roof that's. I have to admit, a, a, a very strong gestural. A uh, green roof that I, I hope we could do. The other roof in plan, um, not sure, let's see. You see this area here where you have the balcony, that's actually an outdoor deck to the upper unit. Mm -hmm. So that that would not be a green roof, but it could certainly, you know, it would logically end up being a he plant heavy area. But the back area is, is deck. the top we have it and we've looked at it as a solar capable roof, so we've, we're actually sort of intending it to be prepared for that. Again, it's an owner option. Um, and the roofs do have slope, obviously. They, they have a parapet that's, show, that's hiding the slope. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm biting my tongue to tease you about the architecture review board, but <laughs> it's an unusual <laughs> development. For uh -huh. us. You know that. Um, I, what hadn't been said is it's sitting right under the back door of Cole Morgan. So in some ways, it, it answers it, that. It does. Way, right? it's indeed. It's really um, interesting yeah. there. And it also, uh, you know, I, I've always regretted that we gave them the best view of the range in town. So I'm happy you're <laughs> taking back a little bit. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad you noticed the <clears throat> connection. Yeah, we were concerned because it's not, it's not in Grove Street neighborhood. It's, it's at the edge, so it kind of tries to straddle that relationship between the industrial and, and the residential. Any other questions from the board? Open up to the public. Anyone here from the public who would like to comment? No? Uh, um, I have some comments from DPW, which were already forwarded on. So I just have them. Um, you don't have to keep the hearing open, but I sort of molded them into some conditions because a lot of them are detailed about stormwater. I did want to note that the applicant, I don't know if you said this, got their permit from the Conservation Commission earlier today. Um, but they need to meet stormwater standards in the Wetlands Protection Act, and um, DPW did have some concerns about some soil tests that I think are probably mirrored in the um, notice of intent and permit that was issued. Um, 
so I don't think it hurts to duplicate those, but um, DPW, um, I think most of the concerns were about just seeing the final calculations for soils, and they've got proposed rain gardens, and so they want to make sure that those, the vegetation in the rain gardens are going to work and the soils will work. Um, and then some, some um, water and sewer connection, or um, water connection issues. Um, so I can just pitch those as possible conditions. You can close a hearing if you want, or wait till you know if you want to leave it open. It's fine. It's might as well leave it open. We can listen to them. Okay. Um, so and just to say, I think you know we had we worked with the applicant um, closely, and they responded to the issues I think in the zoning. So from our perspective, for the most part, except for these technical details, I think you know, it meets the requirements in the ordinance. Um, so proposed conditions um, prior to issuance of a building permit, plan details should be revised um, with and submitted to this um, DPW with a copy to the planning office um, and um, make sure all the details are consistent between all the plans, the stormwater plan, the um, notice of intent plans, and the planning board plans. Additional soil information is required to confirm infiltration um, capabilities. Um, details should um, also be submitted um, from the soil, uh, from a certified soil evaluator or certified professional soil scientist um, uh, for complete test pit data um, it, um, to show seasonal, estimated seasonal high groundwater elevations and to the extent that any restrictive soils in the area of the proposed rain garden and confirm the design and function of that rain garden. Plan shall be revised and submitted to the Office of Planning and Sustainability to include uh, material of the proposed drainage pipe, the detail of the proposed catch basins um, with 30 inch sump, and at a minimum, catch basin in the paved area should include hooded outlet and a four foot sump. Um, elevation of the outlet pipe in the proposed rain garden and plantings for the proposed rain garden. So I don't know if the CONSCOM addressed that and are, they're fine with it without the requirements of those. Um, but so we can talk about that because I don't know what happened at the Conservation Commission. Um, the driveway should be graded so that runoff doesn't enter the roadway. Um, and um, DPW would like the salvage granite curbing to be returned to the DPW yard. Um, <laughs> a separate um, exterior water service shutoff and interior meters required for each separately owned condo unit. The applicant shall coordinate with the water department to install a new two-inch tap and curb stop at the property line and to abandon the existing service um, when the, before the building's um, demolished or at the time. Um, the proposed sewer manhole shall be located as close as practicable to the property line. The proposed sewer manhole chimney for the connection to Grove Street shall be constructed in accordance with the DPW standard details. Sewer manhole on Grove Street shall be core drilled to accept the new chimney service in connection. And the existing sewer service, which is not shown, shall be cut and capped near the property line. Could you go back to, the, I think, the first one? Uh -huh. About yeah. the grading? Provide, oh, um, yeah. So the driveway needs to be pitched so it drains onto the property, not so that it just drains water right into the street. So you, you, typically you can either pitch it to the side or put a ber berm right at the end of the driveway so that it catches the water before it goes. Carolyn, on the are those just are they working off a standard checklist because the whole the whole property drains it in the other way? In right, that's what direction. I'm. That's what I was trying to understand. It, I, I think it's just the drive itself. Just the drive itself, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, it's just at the back yeah. end of it right. or right. the front but, end. Yeah, of yeah. It, mm -hmm. it oh. still seems like it naturally will come. I guess. Yeah, I guess a little bit. I'm not understanding. You gotta walk uphill to get to the road. <laughs> kind of. Is that what they're? I mean, is that essentially but it what they're saying? There's a little bit. It just oh, curves no, coming it down. So it's, it's sloping it down. It slopes okay. Back to growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, no, so what they're saying is um, the way the drawings currently show, we have curb on both sides of the driveway. So he's suggesting yeah. that we super elevate it a little bit more, take the curb off of one side, so that the rainwater can oh, sort right. of. And she, doesn't she funnel, it doesn't funnel it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's when I'm. Okay. That's uh, that makes more sense. We also just want to mention that we got those comments today, and Guntlow and Associates actually spent the day um, preparing corrected drawings to address all of the so all almost of the all those issues. With right? the rain garden and the sewer and the water connections. I have revised drawings with me. Okay. okay. I don't know if you want them or if you just 
want to give them. What if those were well, conditions if, to? And you've already done them, right. so. Right. You have no them. issue okay. with the conditions by the DPW. Right. But, okay. but it's not, you don't have to create like a dip artificially. I mean, no, no. you just yeah. have to do the, with the curbing right. and, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, so the only question I have for you was about this, um, the catch basin. As to how it was addressed earlier today? Yeah. Did they have a similar issue for? Um, they did address those as staff comments. Okay. Uh, so the same, basically, they kind of forward on most of those issues okay. as well. Okay. They, so. Yeah, they were incorporated in their, I think, conditions 35 yeah. to 40 or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. tacked them onto the Uh, public comment is still open. Suppose we second. <laughs> uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, any more discussion? So we have, it sounds like we have two conditions, basically the DPW, all those conditions, and then maybe one on the lighting for the carport that it either be on a timer or um, a motion sensor or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. I know it's late, but can I just make a comment that I know we don't have a lot of purview over. I just want to say it though. So I love, I love the design. I love this development. I think um, it's it's very challenging to be creating small condominium associations, small condominium, mm -hmm. you know, four condominium units that um, you know that don't have a requirement for outside property management. It just, you know, I live in a condominium, I, I choose that, I love it, but it's just an interesting thing for us to be aware of as we see, you know, we saw a two, a two and two over on Phillips Place not long ago, that mm -hmm. it's just something, you know, <coughs> for us to be aware of that, you know, it's kind of creating a whole other set of issues with how we use land here in town right. for housing. Okay. Sleep on it. Yeah. <laughs> So what was the lighting condition? The lighting on the oh, carport the, um, yeah. should either be on a motion sensor mm -hmm. or a timer so that it turns off at an appropriate hour. So it's not, so it's on, not all on all night. Right. I move we approve site plan by Shop Development LLC for 2,000 square foot and four residential units and two structures at 108 Grove Street, map ID 38C-10 with the conditions stated by the DPW and a condition for lighting to be on a timer or a motion sensor. Second. John, keep sneaking in there. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Good to go. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I know. I move we approve the next one. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it. So, see us going down. Are you suggesting then in the long run you're going to be looking at things that don't get there? It's just wrong. Because small. Yeah, interpersonally when you have real estate issues. Oh, you know, 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 you it's interesting. All right, one more hearing left. We have some more items left, but one more hearing left. It's scheduled for 8.45, so we're still a little behind. Uh, for a subdivision amendment to install a water line in lieu of wells and fire suppression at Emerson Way, formerly the Oaks, Florence Map ID 36-409. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Darnold from Berkshire Design Group. Um, this is a project that was approved quite a few years ago. It used to be called the Oaks and it's been changed to um, uh, Emerson Way. And by, you know, essentially all we're asking to do is to add some additional water lines and a booster pump station. Um, the map up here we show, it's, um, you can see this is uh, First Pit Road. This is the existing subdivision that's been approved. The yellow lots that you see here are serviced by the existing water main that has been installed. When the project was first approved, 
the uh, lots in blue were too high of an elevation to have adequate water supply. So they were approved to be constructed with wells and also with fire suppression systems, uh, essentially sprinklers. The proposal is to construct additional water main which would service the blue areas and also at the same time put in a booster pump station which would boost up the pressure not only to allow the upper areas to have water for domestic as also to have adequate water for fire protection as well it would also boost the pressure for the lots existing lots on the uh, yellow color lots because they're on the marginal side of the town um, the booster station would be um, back up with the generator so if there ever were a power outage or a problem with that they would still have power to run it. It'd be uh, the generator would be gas powered, natural gas powered. It'd be electric powered uh, gener generator. The um, pump station would be located on the uh, emergency access road, uh, so therefore it would not be located with any of the previously approved open areas. So not any violation of the existing um, subdivision approval. Um, that's really a quick scenario. We met with the fire department twice to discuss the project. Uh, they were on board. We went with them early on to make sure they were comfortable with the concept. And we met with them not too long ago to have them look at their latest plans. Verbally, they said there was no problem. We met several times with the uh, DPW to make sure they're comfortable with the design. They had the project uh, reviewed by their consultant engineer as essentially had the water model for the entire town. And they ran it through there and they concurred and had some comments on the project. Um, and we, we were concurring with that and actually they looked at the model. We had originally designed a booster pump station to accommodate the water pressure as it exists today. Their uh, consultant recommended that let's look at the project based upon the 2032, the year 2032. So it's been designed to accommodate future demands. Uh, we always had a demand but they wanted to make sure that if the booster pump kicked on it wouldn't cause a problem in the neighborhood, suck their water dry and cause a problem there. So that's been evaluated, it's been looked at. Uh, we have a letter from DPW um, that have looked at it and reviewed. And this is very similar to, to Bear Hill Estates. Um, I did design very similar to this. We put a booster pump station up there. The town is familiar with it, the fire department is familiar with it. It's not a new creature. Um, it's been tried and true and it's been in existence in Northampton for a while. So I think people understand it and familiar with it. Where is Real quick scenario. Where's the generator? Uh, the generator is actually located inside the booster pump station. We have the booster pump. This is the emergency access road, which mm -hmm. services the detention basin. And we have the booster pump station. It's actually in the building. And we'll have the pumps inside as well as the generator inside. It'll be bu uh, buffled so it can cut down. The so even though it cycles once a week or whatever, it, from a sound we'll standpoint, it won't be. The daytime, we wouldn't do it at 3 in the morning. We'll right. do it like at noon. Uh, just to keep the neighbors happy. But it's enclosed. It's enclosed. It's, everything's within inside the same building. So how many lots do you have there? Total number of lots. Um, 59. How many? 59 total. 59, 59 total lots. Okay. So Bear Hill had a water pump problem, and the top hills last time were having water problems. So what happens if one of these things goes out? Um, th there's actually three pumps inside this pump station. Yeah, there were in the Fair Hill one, too, as far as I understand. Yeah. I, I'm not aware that they had a problem with the uh, okay. water pressure up there. Okay. I mean, I, Just I, saying. It, it's a mechanical <laughs> scenario. Yeah. There's a potential for something to happen, and when it happens, they need to address it. I mean, it's designed, it's working. So if there's a mechanical problem, I'm assuming it was addressed. I'm, I'm not aware of that. Oh, yeah, well, I see it was, yeah. but I just, it's a very similar situation. Yes, it is. Who maintains it? What's uh, the homeowners association will be maintaining it. Uh, Hampshire Property Management Group is still the primary owner of the subdivision, but as they get enough homeowners in there, they would create a homeowners association. They would be responsible for maintenance of the uh, pump station. That's one of the comments, or the only comment from staff was that the homeowner association, the language, be amended to reflect that the maintenance is owned by by the homeowners uh, association. So that will be done. So is there currently one now, or once you reach a certain level, one will be created? Um, I'll let Rich. Mark, one will be created. We're near that level right now. It's 15, and we'll pass that in the next 6 to 12 months. So for the sake of argument, in the next 3 to 5 months, if there's an issue, well, 
I, I'm just playing devil's advocate. If there's an issue and there's not a homeowners association is relative to the maintenance, how is that addressed? The developer is actually Emerson Way LLC. It's not Hampshire Property Management Group. There, we're the property management agent. Emerson Way LLC will address mm -hmm. any shortfalls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just clarify. There is an so there is, there are covenants and restrictions already mm -hmm. recorded, and has and sh and identifies the mechanism of at, at what point the developer shifts everything over. So mm -hmm. all of the documentation is on record at the Registry of Deeds. So um, for all the other maintenance issues that go along with this subdivision, because all of this is private, actually, right. all the infrastructure. So. Um, that's already the framework is already there the details are already there this would be going in and um adding right so this, this is a new component. maintenance item that's not addressed exactly. yet but right. the la that language will be included and the only the issue is though there are existing owners in the property so you know they're right. they're <laughs> they have to uh, you know they have to figure out how they're going to get the documents changed on right. those owners okay lots. And this is more of a technical matter. DPW signed off on it, so I don't have any clue that I think ultimately it's a better system than yeah. it exists now. But uh, questions from the board? Open up to the public. There's not much left. Not many people <laughs> left standing. <laughs> no comments from the public. We have a way of wearing them down. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, motion to close. So moved. Second. 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 Discussion. So the only condition we would have was that the uh, HOA documents would be amended to assign the maintenance responsibilities of this change to the, to the HOA. And then just to also language, DPW wants to review those before they're recorded to make sure um, the documents um, okay. accurately reflect what needs to be reflected in terms of maintenance. So the amended documents, A, the documents have to be amended, B, they have to be reviewed by DPW. Mm -hmm. I have to trust DPW on these things. I mean, that's just the bottom line on it. But there is just a nagging side of me that says you start segmenting the water system into private pieces that hook onto the public system. And I really hope they're, that I'm trusting them to review all of the implications of that in the future. This is a long discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. Uh, I need a motion. I don't know if it's over. <laughs> I move we um, that the subdivision amendment to install water line in lieu of wells and power suppression at Emerson Way, formerly the Oaks Florence Map ID 36-409, be approved with the condition that the condominium documents reflect it. The HOA be amended and that DPW sign off on it. Thank That's you. It. That's what I meant. <laughs> Second. Second. Any, any discussion? Yeah, I think you may want to specifically say the condominium documents because it's not let them decide which of the many documents have mm -hmm. to be amended. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thanks, Thank Mark. You Thank you. Okay, we have a couple quick items. Did they leave that behind? I was thinking of that. It ended up at the end of the line. I said, oh, make a mental note to give them a heads up. And Wait, oh, the, the presentation, the first presentation. Oh. Into, uh, with the department. I think Dan wants to take them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you think? Do you use that for work? Thing? Oh. All right, so we got a couple of things. Um, I don't have minutes for you. I was working on them late today. Quite good. Um, so, did you guys? I hope you all got the quick email about Scanlon yes. Drive Avenue. Yes. I can't remember. So, um, this is probably the tail. We're getting to the tail end of the list of streets that were never made public. Um, so you saw Scanlon goes from Florence and is that little short list. PPW has made all sorts of changes on that street along the way without realizing that it wasn't a public street for them to make changes on. So we kind of we need to correct that, but from you know, it, it acts. I mean, our recommendation would be that it makes sense to be a public street um, because it's part of the fabric of the uh, the network of streets um, in that area. So um, that's certainly our recommendation. Board of Public Works has voted on it to recommend it to City Council. So City Council is just waiting for what you all might say about it. In in the past, when we've had a lot of discussion, if there was any ambiguity at all. 
we, we wouldn't even take we would just push it off to the DPW say that's you know that's really not for us to say that's DPW no we don't comment on it in any way for those roads that were clearly streets we would say that's a street and we we vote in recommendation of that I think this falls uh, to that uh, line it's a street yeah and, and it's it used to be a two-way street and then now it's a one-way street DPW's made changes to it because they thought it was a street um, <laughs> then they find out it's not uh, and so uh, I would recommend that we, the board, approve it as a street. Second. Second. Any other discussion? So we're recommending the council to accept it as a street. All in favor? Opposed? Who made the motion? Okay. Mark did second. it. I second. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so now. <laughs> Carolyn, five. The explanation is going to be longer than the actual. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> so, um, I have two approval not required plans, and. So why are we? So know. why are we approving exactly. them? Listen, that's a good. <laughs> Most of you know. Some of you know what these are. Some of you don't. Um, these we had been doing. So approval not required means subdivision approval under the subdivision law is not required to create. Uh, to carve up a new lot and the reason why it might not be uh, subdivision might not be required is because the parcel exists on a public way or a way that has been um, it it provides adequate a access <laughs> or was uh, built before the subdivision rules and so forth um, this has um, always been for decades has been an administrative action that a planning board member has been designated as someone to come into the office and sign off on the a &Rs to say um, you, you, there is a specific process you have to go through to create these lots on existing streets if you have and you meet the adequate frontage requirements for those streets. Um, then the rules changed and the planning board could designate staff to do the endorsement. So then staff started doing these. Um, we recently discovered that we were interpreting the rules a little bit differently than they should be interpreted. And really, the planning board needs to vote that it is an A&R plan, and then anybody can endorse it, any designee from the planning board. So I'm here with two A&Rs for you to look at, and I'm going to describe them quickly, and then you guys need to take a vote and say, yes, that's an A&R, and then I can sign them in the office and so send them on the merry way. So every time there's an A&R submission, it needs to come up here for discussion. Yeah. Yeah. We have to approve that approval is not required. Right. <laughs> and it happens in a lot of small towns because there isn't staff. It always gets to, you know they get put in a pile to go to the planning board for the next planning board meeting. But you know for years and year over 25 years we've just been doing it in the office. We call a planning board member or more recently just staff has been doing it. And um, that's not the right way. So we want to correct that. Um, so, so the first one is on Con Street. Is that okay? Do you have a question? It is, although um, you actually meet. So th there is an option possibly that a planning board member can do that as opposed to the group? No. no. Only okay. after that's the, the way we because, had been yeah. doing it. That's right. the way we had been doing it. Right. Okay. And that's not. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Con Street. So Con Street, um, they actually both of these are a result of the change in the zoning to reduce the frontage. So on Con Street, it's Urban Residential C. Um, there's an existing house, and they had just over 100 feet of frontage. So uh, and the house happened to be shifted over to the side. So they've created another rectangular lot with a minimum 50. Actually, it's. Yep, one of them will be 57 feet of frontage, the other one 50 feet of frontage. It meets the minimum lot size, although we technically that's not what's under consideration for approval not required plans, only frontage. Um, so this one's Con Street. Um, do I take a vote on that one? I vote. All in favor? Okay. <laughs> Um, and the next one is in actually URA on Vernon Street, sort of right on the edge of Urban Residential B and A, off of Elm Street. Um, and similar situation, um, there's a dwelling that's on the, it's on a really large lot, actually 20,000 square feet. Um, and extra frontage, um, the house was situated in a way that they could still meet the setback and create a second, almost 10,000 square foot lot. Um, 
55 feet of frontage for the new parcel, the existing the house, the existing house on the parcel would have probably twice that um, amount of frontage. So that's that one. Can we approve from Vernon Street? Okay. Second. Tess, all in favor? All right. That house on Vernon Street, even though it, the the wedge of the lot, it still needs to be up a face facing. It needs to be in the street line, right? Right. It mm. still needs to, any new house would still need to meet the design standards. This is just to create the lot. So right. this is sort of step one of that process. You could see that that lot lended lent itself to doing this. So. Mm -hmm. It drops off a whole lot at the back. It would be yeah. tempting to put the house at the back. Um. <laughs> if you want to accept all that water into your... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and 10, that's it. Uh, 29 and a half. <laughs> but who's counting? I know. <laughs> uh, do I have a motion? I move. We adjourn. Yeah. Second. Test. All in favor? Yo. Hey. Hey. Time to go.